Hello. Hello, Siobhan. Oh, you got your, you're still muted, Siobhan. <laughs> Hello, Rob, welcome. Hello, thank you very much. So we've just been in a pre-meet with um, uh, the chair and vice chairs, Pippa, Jeff and, um, and uh, actually Martin wasn't there actually. Um, so they will be, <laughs> they'll be there in a moment. Okay, good. I'm sorry about the amount of information that I've, I've given you, but... Uh... Yeah, no worries, no worries. I'm going to go off on, um, I'm going to close my, <laughs> my, my video. Thank you, everybody, and good afternoon, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream of, of this meeting. And this is um, South Cambridge's District Council Climate Change and Environment Advisory Committee. My name is Councillor Pippa Halings, and I'm chairing this meeting. Um, and for the information of members of the public, our committee advises Cabinet on the actions required to achieve the Council's targets on climate change and its environmental commitments um, through the doubling nature strategy also. So please, can those present in the council chamber note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen and phones, is likely to be broadcast at some point. 
The camera follows the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are advised to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. And those participating via live stream, hello, nice to see you. Happy New Year, Happy New Year, everybody. It's very strange to be here in the, in the chamber with just a, with just a few of us, um, but we know that well, the conditions continue with COVID. So those participating in the meeting via the live stream, please indicate that you wish to speak um, via the chat column. And please don't use the chat column for any other purpose. Make sure your device is fully charged and you switch your microphone off unless invited to do otherwise. Um, and when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure that you switch on the microphone and again, let the camera um, come on to you. Speak slowly and clearly. Please don't talk over or interrupt anyone. Um, we'll move very quickly to item number one on the agenda, which is apologies. Um, and Patrick, are there apologies for absence today, please? No, no, Chair, we've got no, uh, no apologies for absence, but Councillor Grenville Chamberlain is attending the meeting virtually. Thank you very much. And I don't hear you so well. Is that, Aaron, are you just checking that? I want to be able to make sure that we can hear, hear everybody clearly. Thank you very much, um, Patrick. And agenda item three minutes of the pre previous meeting. Um, are members happy to approve these minutes of the meeting as a correct record? Or does anyone have any suggested amendments to those meetings, to those minutes? Right, so I've got page one, no, page two, page three, page four, and page five. So if not, I move the approval of the minutes and if I can do that by affirmation, everyone. Yep, thank you very much. Okay, so the committee therefore agrees the approval of the minutes of the meeting on the 23rd of November as a correct record. Agenda item four, uh, minutes arising from the minutes and uh, are there any other matters arising members from those minutes or Patrick from those minutes? I don't see any here from anybody in the chamber, um, and so none there. So we'll move on to the first substantive item on our agenda, which is being eagerly um, anticipated and awaited, which is the Council's um, HRA Asset Manage Management Strategy 2021 to 2026. And we know that that has come um, before our committee, uh, on a couple of occasions, I think, and we've you know, been very, very interested in how this, is, um, how this has been developed. And it's, it's a key, key piece of, of what we do in terms of um, all sorts of issues within the council, but particularly of interest to us here in the committee, both in terms of how we're going to meet our climate change targets, um, in terms of our housing stock, with very, very difficult issues around um, energy efficiency, but also critically, especially now in this context, when we're hearing about rising energy bills and how they're going to hit households and knowing the number of households living in fuel poverty um, in our area is, is also that helps deal with those energy bills too and that cost of living, keeping people warm, healthy um, and safe. So um, I would like to receive a report on the asset management strategy relating to the housing revenue account. And this is going to cabinet on the 7th of, Mem of February. And the director of housing, Peter Campbell, is going to present this report. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to share some slides with you. So if, Patrick, can you confirm when these are visible, please? Yes, we can see them now. Thank you. I, I, I... I've lost sight, so can you keep me advised if, if there's any questions or anything come up whilst I'm presenting, please, Patrick? Thank you. So, yes, I'm here to, um, uh, I'm Peter Campbell, I'm the Head of Housing, here to talk about the HRA Asset Management Strategy. And this is a, a document that's probably taken a year or so to develop, and there's a lot of um, uh, detail in it, which I hope becomes apparent uh, as we go through. So why do we need Oh, so, so what's it all about? Why do we need an asset management strategy? Well, the HRA, the housing stock, is probably the largest asset owned by the council. We've got about 
5,300 homes, and that's growing. We continue to uh, acquire and build properties. We've also got other assets, garages, open space, etc. The value of our holding in the uh, in, in the HRA, open market value, is uh, about 1.4 billion, and it's growing not only as our stock increases, but to the value of stock increases. We're the major housing provider uh, in the area, so it's important that we have a clear strategy. Uh, and plan for managing our housing stock. Our approach to asset management is that it's more than just how we best manage the assets. So what we're trying to do within the strategy is, is to explain the context, why we're doing things, uh, and not just what we are doing. We're very clear that we're placing customers front and centre in everything that we do and the importance um, of involving uh, our current customers, tenants in what we do. Uh, but also seeking the views from the wider community who could be our future customers. We recognise that we're lucky. The housing department is part of the council uh, and, and we've got an opportunity to contribute towards the wider range of the council. And unashamedly, uh, within the housing service, uh, what we want to do is what we want to strive to be, to, to be the best. And there's no reason why, why we can't uh, be that. So what we have got a number of principles within the uh, asset management strategy. We recognise that uh, it's much more more, more than uh, being about bricks and mortar. What we have a, a role to do is building places, places where people feel safe and where communities um, thrive. And there's a few main themes around that. We want our properties to be high quality and energy efficient. We want the whole service to be customer focused. We want to be supportive. We recognise that we deal with some of those vulnerable people uh, in society and we want to make sure that they have the support that they need and deserve. We're accountable. We're part of the local authority and we, we, we've got a responsible, uh, res responsible um, to members and via the members to, to, the wider, to the wider public. And we're professional. We want to set the highest standards in, in everything that, that we do. So why have we got um, uh, developed that asset management strategy? What are the drivers? What are the wider issues that have, that have impacted uh, on the strategy? Well, first, we've got the HRA reform. So this is where um, the uh, housing services are self-financing. We've got the ability to borrow for building, uh, et cetera. There's a, just a general uh, trend of social housing reform. The Charter of Social Housing, uh, the Charter for Social Housing Residents, which itself has its origins back in uh, uh, the, the uh, tragedy at Grenfell Towers. We've, we've got drivers from uh, Homes England, the standards that they set. We can trace this back to the Decent Homes Standard, which was the first attempt to have a uh, have a uh, recognised standard um, uh, for social housing, and moving forward and developing uh, and developing those. Uh, to ensure that our properties uh, do remain decent and fit for purpose. And there's the Homes Fitness and Human Habitation Act in, uh, of 2018, which is the opposite end. So that, that controls the minimum standards which houses uh, should be provided. The strategy has lots of background data. I make no apologies for that. It may not be the most interesting thing to, uh, to read, but it's about setting the scene and, set, and setting the context. Hopefully by um, presenting uh, the data, it's very clear uh, why um, we're doing some of the things that, 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 that we're proposing. Uh, and you will see time and time again throughout the, uh, the strategy, we make reference to involving customers uh, and, and involving the customers in delivering our priorities. Um, the strategic priorities, the first, the first overall in, um, um, overarching aim to provide good quality, sustainable homes that are affordable to live in where people choose to live. So if this is important. We provide social housing. We don't provide second, uh, second class housing. We want all our properties to be at the highest possible standard. We've got specific targets uh, below that. I'm not uh, planning to go through all these, just some of the priorities which I think are more um, relevant uh, to this committee. Priority A, and probably the top priority, 
ensure that homes we provide are safe and secure and meet or exceed all statutory safety standards and picking up from some of the you know, tragedies that have happened elsewhere in the country it's of paramount importance uh, that all our properties are safe and secure we meet all the minimum standard and sometimes i mean clearly the risk of not doing this is you know is tremendous it's inconceivable that, that we do something wrong and we're not just talking about a a, a a major disaster such as happened at Grenfell, but we need to make sure that all our properties have the gas servicing carried out. We have proper fire alarms. We have um, um, fire doors, et cetera, et cetera. We will meet or exceed all statutory standard. Priority B, to have in place well-designed repairs and maintenance systems that ensure that homes are well-maintained and kept in a good state of repair. To some organisations, this is the extent of their asset management strategy. This is all. This is all that they do. We do so much more than this. So this is only one one leg uh, of our strategy. Uh, and as members will know, we are currently um, a point in the process of appointing a, a new contractor um, to take a contract which could last up to 15 years uh, to do the work that's carried, uh, currently carried out by Mears. And in fact, I've just left um, uh, a session which is looking at the uh, looking at tenders in order to come and give this presentation. Priority C, which is very important to, to this uh, to this committee, to have a long term strategy and program to improve the thermal efficiency of homes, reduce the carbon emissions with the aim of being carbon neutral by 2050. So how do we do this? Is that we've got really um, three strands. The first one is to plan to reduce energy, uh, the overall energy use uh, by increasing insulation, a fabric first approach, which will uh, re say, say, reduce energy use regardless of the form of heating. The second strand is the use of technology, um, new forms of uh, heating, uh, uh, especially uh, new, new technology. We want to make sure that we just don't um, uh, act on what sold to us, but we test these out uh, in reality. So we fit we, we fit tests in properties. We record the results over the long term uh, and in real time, and we monitor the effectiveness once they meet uh, once this technology meets the real world. And what we are doing also is that we're sharing this information uh, with uh, with other organisations um, through a a data sharing club that we're in. And the third um, element about this is, is education. Is uh, uh, people in, in social housing moving to a property that are energy efficient may mean cha making changes to their lifestyle. It may change, uh, for example, in ventilation with clothes drying. We need to make sure that we provide sufficient education to our customers, to our clients. Uh, to make sure that they understand what the implications are of living in a low carbon property and how they can benefit from it uh, from it as well. Priority D is uh, about involving tenants again to involve our uh, ensure that our homes are brought up and maintained at a locally determined standard, remaining attractive and meeting modern requirements and tenant expectations. So it's, this is not just about bringing our properties up to a decent home standard. This is developing a, a new local South Cam standard and um, which will involve uh, tenants in designing the standards and bringing our properties up to that level. Priority E, to replace obsolete and, and economic properties with new homes that are better designed to meet future needs and to create a better balanced portfolio, hold, um, portfolio of properties. Look, we're not in a bad position. We don't have whole rafts of uh, high rise or poorly designed properties, but we do we, we do have some. And what we may have to do is to recognise that some of the properties um, are too difficult to bring up to a modern standard, and we there may be options to uh, uh, demolish these and, and to rebuild them rather than uh, uh, rather than just to try to bring the current shell up to uh, up to a modern standard. Uh, and it, it may make some difficult, um, may mean that we need to make some difficult decisions, and uh, you know, people may lose their homes through this. But we'll have a, a better balanced portfolio of properties uh, at the end. 
uh, and priority F to identify opportunities to, to grow the stock through purchase, uh, purchase or direct build um, and to increase the number of council properties available. And importantly, these are, we're not just willy nilly, these are properties that are the type and the quality and areas where people choose to live. And uh, priority G is to ensure that our homes meet the requirements of people with specific needs. We have a high number of uh, our uh, customers who've got specific needs, who need an adaptation to properties, and we need to make sure that um, our, our stock is of high enough quality and has many ad adaptations uh, that people need moving forward. So what next? Um, we've got a commitment to improve our approach to asset management. As I said previously, we um, we strive to be the best. We're starting that by making sure that we have the data to make decisions. We want our decisions based on sound and reliable data. So you will see some of the uh, early actions within the asset management strategy around, around stock condition survey, uh, uh, and uh, tenant surveys about gathering information and data to make sure that we are making informed decisions moving forward. We're going to set targets and monitor, uh, monitor those. Uh, we will, once we have the relevant data, we'll set targets. We'll make sure that they're robustly monitoring, uh, monitored, uh, and uh, making sure that our customers, as well as uh, as well as tenant, as well as members are involved in that process and through this what we want is a, is a process of no surprise we want to have long-term plans um, to how we will we'll improve our property and invest in our properties we're about setting standards and we're talking about setting the highest possible standards that, that we can and they're affordable uh, rather than just a, a minimum standard and we want to create an environment where officers councillors and our customers can work together to improve the housing stock. Indeed, I've just left a, uh, a meeting which is scoring the, uh, uh, the, the, the tenants for the uh, for the repairs contract. Within that meeting, we have got councillors, we've got tenants, and we've got a group of my officers uh, who've been working uh, all day in doing this. But we also we, we recognise that the asset management strategy is very much a first step you know, it's called building the foundations for a reason. It's about getting us to a place from from which we can build. It's a, a document that we're determined is not going to remain on the on the shelf. It's one that we're going to look at. But having said that, we're all already looking towards um, uh, uh, developing this and coming along with the next iteration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. And you know, as you said, inconscionable, inconscionable. To, to not be acting and, and having this and huge piece of work and I know that's something that's been your priority since you joined us um, and it's, we can just hear how you know pleased and proud you you are of this of this work and how it can he set the journey um, ahead so I'd, I'd like to call the members of the committee to see if you have any comments responses to the asset management strategy which will be going to cabinet thank you yes Councillor Graham And, and welcome, Captain. It's nice. To, it's good that you've been able to, to join us. You just joined us slightly late, that's all. No, and wait until we are connected so that everyone can hear it. That's okay, there's a slight hitch in, in getting connected. No, I'd like you to be able to hear everything as well anyway, so. Lovely, um, yeah, so my question um, uh, was to, to uh, Peter, about um, the on, on the second point, um, he talks about installation um, uh, for uh, council housing stock, and then the third point was uh, education 
On, on the new technology point, um, what types of uh, new technology does he envisage and um, yeah, how difficult are they going to be to implement and how costly are they going to be? Um, and I suppose the, the part three to his sort of proposal there is about education in terms of how do we get um, our, our residents to use those new technologies sort of in, in the best way, really. Thank you. Peter. Okay, then. Um, <laughs> we've not made a, a, any decision yet which, which um, determines what technology we, we, we will or, or uh, will not use. Uh, and it's very likely that during the life of this strategy, um, uh, new technology will be uh, introduced that isn't yet available. Or, or what's currently available as cutting edge, very, very expensive technology uh, w w will become uh, uh, more affordable and importantly, uh, more reliable. So not wishing to dodge the question, but um, uh, just to assure members that, that what our aim is, is, to, ma is to, to make use of the best technology that's available at the moment in time that, that we're looking at, um, uh, uh, Installation. Um, when I'm looking at some of the things that are available, um, you know, the, the one thing that, that we've considered, uh, particularly with new build, um, is um, uh, passive house, uh, which is you know, increased insulation and relies on uh, low energy use within a property uh by basically making the, the the property much more airtight than the, the, the normal property and making sure that the uh, energy with inside uh, inside the property is is better used um that has a price premium over uh, um uh, other properties it's difficult to work out what what the the differential is because it's not that we're starting off at a low standard uh, and we're stepping up to um, you know, um, a passive house, which, which may be, you know, a, say, a 30%. What we want is, you know, what we recognise that passive house is probably a, an incremental improvement over the um, existing high standards that we offer in, in all our new build and, and acquired properties. But I chose that passive house for, for a reason uh, in, in this example, is that you know, if I was going out to, to buy a uh, to buy a new property, and I made a decision to live in a a, a passive house uh, property, myself and my family would would make a a longer term commitment to adapting our lifestyle to cope with that, and that you know, th th and we would you know think of the way that we lived, which may include. You know, uh, uh, accepting that, that, that there's less uh, uh, ventilation in the property, accepting that uh, if there were radiators in the property, they're likely to have a, a, a lower surface temperature um, than would be expected from a traditional um, uh, gas-fired central heating system. If somebody applies for, for, for social housing, they've perhaps not made that same sort of long-term commitment towards adapting their lifestyle to to, to um, uh, make the most out of their property. And in fact, that many people will not have the, the information that allows, allows them to do that. So by education, what I'm talking about is making sure that the people who um, are and will become our tenants uh, have in their possession the knowledge uh, that they need to make the best um, of the um, uh, of the technology and standards uh, of our uh, of our homes that they benefit from from it and they too can you know, benefit from from the law um, the lower energy costs etc. So it's making sure that people have have the have the knowledge which is relevant to their own particular property. I'm sorry, Councillor, that was a rather long answer, but I, I hope I've uh, addressed the points that that, that you raised. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Members, any other comments? Yes, I have Councillor Pope Bart. 
Paul Bedwack and then Councillor Jeff Harvey and then Councillor Peter Payne. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just a comment on the, a general comment on the strategy, but also I have a question about kind of short-term challenges uh, specifically regarding um, rising energy costs. So just in terms of the strategy generally, it's good to see that it's such an aspirational strategy. I think um, generally, um, you know, residents and tenants will be very happy to hear that um, the council is striving to be the best in terms of what it's offering. Um, in terms of the comment on the short term, I remember a few years ago, um, someone said to me that we need to think about the heating systems in our homes as machines. So they need to be well maintained, but they also need to be operated correctly. And um, with the rising energy costs, um, I wondered whether um, you know, there is an opportunity here to ensure that everybody uh, has a clear understanding of how to operate their heating systems. Uh, for instance, do they have um, the information specific to their heating system within their home? I mean, you know, there's a, there are general points. There's often a misconception that if you come into a cold house, um, whacking up the uh, thermostat will make it heat up quicker. But actually it won't, it will just cause it to overshoot. Um, but you know, for, for instance, if someone's away from their home, do they know how to operate the holiday mode, for instance? Uh, do they have the information to be able to do that? Because all those sorts of things will help to minimise people's energy bills at a time when everybody is going to be struggling with uh, very, very high increases in energy bills. Good, thank you very much. And what I'm going to do, if it's okay with you, Peter, is to take a couple of questions so of um, that you can do. And um, Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, um, you did ask a question. I didn't see it on the chat, so thank you very much. You'd like to take, I can take your question next. Thank you, Chair. Happy New Year to you all, first of all. Um, not so much a question in, uh, from me, but um, just a point that the Scrutiny and Overview Committee did, in fact, consider this report at its recent meeting. And there were, I think, a couple of points which I'd like to make, which are particularly relevant um, to this committee. And the first is that we uh, recommended that Cabinet should ensure that the strategy seeks not only to maintain the fabric of its housing stock, but also the estate surrounding that stock. And of course, that would particularly include um, a reference to biodiversity gains that we might um, achieve. Uh, and I think the other point that I would make, which again is particularly uh, relative today, is that when we are insulating the council housing, we should give priority to those residents who might be most at risk of encountering fuel poverty, um, because they will be the people who will be uh, impacted fastest and most seriously. So just a couple of points from me, Chair, and thank you for that. Thank you so much, um, Councillor Chamberlain. Yes, and we'll, we'll come back to that too. Um, and Councillor Jeff Harvey. So, thank you, Chair. Um, just looking at page 59, and 60 of the report, and um, we're looking at a, a sort of three-stage process. Uh, stage one is reducing the energy demand. Stage two is using more um, efficient heating systems. And stage three would be um, to, to offset any residual. We're looking at things like solar panels. But I was wondering if, the, if there are ways to make um, solar panels um, self-financing, why we wouldn't um, perhaps you know, do those contemporaneously with stage one to get the sort of maximum benefit from them. Um, and then I, I wondered also, sort of on a similar theme, um, on page 60, it's looking at um, the possibility that South Cams could actually um, create renewable energy off-site. And I'm wondering whether that's possible to do within the HRA um, account, if you like. Um, which, which could be quite interesting. And then and I just thought, um, second, th second or third paragraph on page 60, I thought it'd be quite useful to um, just um, clarify whether those costs are actually in sort of today money or, or, you know, are they in sort of discounted cash flow terms or net present value terms or, or are they just like the amount of cash, which um, are kind of going to be different things. Thank you. And Councillor Peter Payne. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, a, a very good report. I'm going to focus on um, the comments on priority C, um, priority N, to replace to put in place, uh, improve the thermal efficiency of homes and reduce their carbon emissions. Uh, to some extent also, I think priority F is relevant here to identify, I'm going to take this off, it's quite difficult to speak through it, um, to identify opportunities to acquire through purchase. Um, so that sometimes we can make improvements to the sustainability of our stock by uh, buying new, building new, or in some cases, replacing old with new. I particularly welcome in that regard the, I think the pieces highlighted in green are probably changes, um, including on page 68, the recognition in response to earlier comments that we could acquire land as well as direct build uh, where this is appropriate. Um, I thought it was just a passing comment, perhaps unfortunate, to start off by saying on Para 21, no climate change implications have been identified. But clearly that same sentence goes on to talk about the opportunities for thermal insulation and working towards net carbon zero. And I feel very strongly that this council should be an exemplar in that. Uh, social housing has always been built to generally higher standards, particularly in the old days of the Code for Sustainable Homes. We've seen it all around South Cairns because they take a longer term view. And I think it's very important this council should set out, show others what can be done uh, within the constraints of what is affordable. Um, turning to page 58, um, I'm sure it's right to identify the, the capacity of the grid. Um, that's uh, item one quite sure what paragraph that is, meeting the, the carbon neutral challenge. Um, and that, of course, relates to new demands on it. If we're going to improve heating systems by going for heat pumps, then that will put additional uh, stress on the grid, as, of course, will EV chargers, which we must recognize in our housing stock as well. Um, paragraph two there refers to electricity being currently more expensive than gas. Uh, sadly, that is a, a changing um, relationship, um, and it depends, of course, on the efficiency of the replacement systems. If we're going for um, uh, heat pumps, we must go for the highest possible coefficient of performance, COP, um, and that may mean that where possible we, for instance, go for ground source. Now, we have the fortunate position as a council owning uh, many different properties, not always uh, sometimes interrupted by houses that have been bought out in between them. But that is a feasible option for us, um, to put in collective heating systems with heat pumps, whether from bores or from slinkies, uh, which many individual landowners or house owners would not be able to do. We can, of course, as in the past, offer the, those who have benefited from right to buy the opportunity to join in with that. Um, I think we also need to just bear in mind that sometimes small improvements that may not seem relevant here can have a significant effect on sustainability and, uh, to some extent, climate change. Uh, bike storage, for instance. Uh, many people, including in uh, our stock of houses, find that taking a bicycle through the passageway to their back garden, uh, or indeed sometimes upstairs to a flat, can be a significant disincentive, particularly if we're talking about an e-bike, which can be quite a valuable thing. And I think we need to look at small improvements as well as the larger improvements. But in general, I, I'm very happy that this document, insofar as it relates to uh, um, the priority C, is setting out a, a leading a way for us to lead the way um, for other uh, holders of housing stock, including RSLs. Thank you very much. Councillor Martin Khan. 
simply, I wanted to comment to ask about the system built houses that you still have in stock. You, 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 you list them, uh, various types, um, and how much of an obstacle that's going to be in terms of uh, improving their performance. Um, first of all, how, how easy are they to improve? Um, because I think presumably the different systems have different uh, scope. Um, and how do you deal with, in particular with system built houses, how do you deal with houses where half is half has been sold off because most many of them are semi-detached. So, um, so you've got one. I particularly noted that you've still got 30 aluminium houses. Um, I'm not sure whether these are the original post-war um, prefabs, which were, um, I, I, when you've still got some of these, but they were very poor performance, and I would imagine they would be sort of, sort of thing which would be difficult to pick up the standards. Um, so I, I'll be interested to hear about that. Thank you. And... Um, just also a couple of comments and questions for myself as well. If you're noting these all down, is that all right, Peter, so that you can, in the round, um, you know, respond to us. Um, so, yes, just once again, I'd like to say, you know, what, what a comprehensive and integrated strategy where we, we see all four priority areas of the council brought to bear on our asset management strategy. And also that, you know, where we see the crossover absolutely critically between climate environment and social you know, issues and looking after residents and making sure that being able to live in houses that are decent and affordable to live in and good places to live. So what I would just like to go back is one of the comments um, I think Councillor Peter Fain mentioned, which is about we don't just want at the end of reports or strategies for the um, obligation to say what are the climate change implications of this strategy to just be a box ticking exercise. And it, you know, Peter was saying, there are implications, as you've rightly said, the implications are that this will contribute, once it's simply, you know, implemented, eventually will contribute towards our net zero strategy. But I would also like to quote you on when you said about it's inconceivable not to um, have this strategy. But there is the other point, which is no action on climate has a huge impact and huge implications. So no action on our housing um, stock to enable them to be um, warmer and better affordable for the people living in there and to reduce you know, what we know are some of the highest emitting um, factors, which is heating in homes, that's huge. So I would say that the climate change implications is a decision not to act on this has huge climate change implications. So I'd just like you to beef up that you know, as an exemplar in terms of how that that is, that is there. It doesn't affect the strategy because the strategy has, um, does, does deal with it. Secondly, I really want to um, applaud what's on page 62 and the fact that um, this council has decided to be part of the Net Zero Collective, which is a national initiative. And what it deals with um, you know, critically is what happened and why previous green home grants and Green New Deal um, have collapsed. And it's, it's about the labor and skills shortage as well. And that's what you're looking at in 62. And, you know, working with the Net Zero Collective, in, as you said, what was it, you know, not just in real time, but um, in, what did you say? Something like in reality, or you, you were saying sort of, you know, you're, we're actually testing this out in the real world, you said, in real time, in the real world. Um, and it's about training and providing examples of what's needed in this retrofit to local um, businesses and also to um, people who are considering upskilling, reskilling in this area. And we know that with the Green Homes Grant last time, this, this was part of the reason why it failed, because there wasn't enough certainty in terms of, you know, how long would it go on for, how many jobs are out there, should we do the upfront capital investment? So it's great that we're looking at setting up what you call would be a center of excellence for decarbonization. That's, you know, and that's the kind of aspiration we need. My question would be, I know this is sort of still a long term, but, but is the Net Zero Collective um, initiative that we're part of locally working together with the skills hubs that are, um, that are now within the region? So that's with the apprenticeship schemes, with GCP, but also um, with the skills retraining hubs that have been built up. So I think it would be good early on to start um, engaging with them that this could be future curriculum you know, work for local um, 
college graduates and, and leave at school years. Then my other piece would be around the calculation of costs. So Councillor Jeff Harvey did mention that, and I also would like to know kind of where did those figures come from. But I also note that you know, what we need to do is a stock audit. And in fact, we kind of put the horse before the cart a couple of years ago. In fact, when we started the Climate Change and Environment Advisory Committee, we asked, what would it cost to retrofit the homes? What you've done is said, hang on, first of all, we really need to know what, what's our strategy for our homes, mm. and then we do the audit. Um, so when would the audit take place? Is that within our budget? Is it something that now we've got the strategy in place where we're prioritizing so that what you'll be able to come back with is and say is, which of the houses, not only kind of what's the situation and status of our housing stock, where are the opportunities? Um, and I know that it's not just costs, but you're also going to come back and be able to say to us, a bit going to Councillor Graham Cohn's question, you know, who would be ready or able to sort of, you know, engage with us on, on this? Because it is about education, and we, we can't just immediately um, repair somebody's, retrofit somebody's home around them. So those were, those were my points. Thank you, Peter. Okay, then I'll, uh, I'll try and read my uh, very poor handwriting and answer more to those questions uh, that, that came up. Um, first of all, um, thank you to Councillor Chamberlain. The, um, it was quite right. The, um, the coloured bits in, in this strategy are bits that have been added uh, and or amended uh, uh, through the feedback process. Um, including through scrutiny uh, and the and the meeting with tenants. So thank you for uh, for for pointing uh, uh, pointing that out. Um, I will start. I'll, I'll probably go backwards through through this if if that's okay. Um, uh, first of all, um, the stock condition survey. Yes, we have got um, sufficient uh, budget in in order to carry out uh, to carry out the survey. But what I want to make sure that we do is this is a a one-off chance to do a survey to gather information uh, on our properties and and to do it properly what i don't want to do is to do something that's um a bit half cocked and having to do it again in five or six years time so what i what what my plan is to do is to engage a specialist consultant to help us to devise a uh, a stock condition survey that suits the needs of this district. So rather than just going buying a um, a standard survey off a surveying company, I want a survey that also uh, allows us to um, uh, to meet our carbon reduction plan. So I, I want I, I will want them to look at um, uh, uh, the thermal efficiency uh, of the property uh, of of the existing walls and roof structure, for example, rather than just the fact that it's a twenty year old slate roof and it might may, may need replacing in five years time, so that 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 we will get information from the stock condition survey that will not only help with the ongoing maintenance uh, of the properties to keep them in their current standard, which is the purpose of a standard survey but also to, to measure what sort of work will be needed uh, to, uh, to meet our carbon reduction targets uh, and to, to, uh, and to uh, allow us to, uh, to plan in the future. It may take longer. It may be more expensive than doing a standard survey, but it'll be cheaper than doing several surveys. So let's do it once and let's, and, and let's do it right. That then comes back to um, one of the uh, points a couple of uh, members have made about the calculation of cost. The, 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 the figures uh, within the uh, re report are ones taken out of the, uh, of the survey that was done by Savills a couple of years ago, which uh, I understand uh, was reported back to this, th this committee previously. And it is nothing more than somebody's best guess at a moment in time. So, so it, th that's that. Hence, the importance of getting the stock condition survey done to make sure that when we move forward, we're we're working on uh, we're working on on accurate figures. Um, going back, um, 
Councillor Fane mentioned the uh, the issue about um, heating systems that were that, that were suitable for uh, larger numbers. So certainly uh, we will look and consider district heating schemes uh, when when they're um, uh, when they're appropriate. We're different from most other authorities um, in so much that we we have um, far fewer. Um, group living schemes. So normally district heating scheme will be put into a, for example, a sheltered housing scheme uh, where, there, where there is a, a, a communal boiler uh, as a direct, re a, a direct replacement. We have only one such scheme and the heating's recently been, uh, uh, been upgraded on that. So that, that wouldn't be a, an option there immediately. But we, we, we could consider that um, and we did consider um, a district heating scheme for that scheme, but it would be um, uh, uneconomic uh, at the time. But we will we'll consider that going forward and recognising that as a consequence of the uh, of the growth plans for the district uh, over coming years, uh, and especially the, um, you know, the growth is going to be around the major developments such as Waterbeats and, and Northstall, in reality, um, most social housing in the coming years are going to be apartments and flats rather than individual properties, uh, individual houses, and that type of property does lend itself uh, more readily to the sort of district heating scheme that uh, Councillor Fane uh, identifies. And coming on from that, um, uh, 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 Councillor Fane also uh, pointed out the, um, the mention in the report, again derived from the Savile report, uh, about the strain um, that we could potentially put on the existing uh, electric grid, and you know, and hinted at, in most cases, um, our ideal solution for um, you know a, a carbon reduction uh, solution for our properties, on top of the insulation, um, would be some sort of you know. Um, uh, some sort of heating system, whether that be ground for uh, uh, ground source uh, or rely on, on on roof panels, which was also backed up with a storage system. So rather than uh, you know rather than reliant on on the uh, uh, on the the national grid to drop up, uh, to top up electricity when we needed, we would try to st um, um, store that uh, uh, the excess uh, heat uh, or electricity on site for for later use. That technology um, is available, and you know, it's the work that we've done with the um, Net Zero Collective so far suggested that, that that might be an option moving forward. But we've also come up with some of the um, some of the limitations um, in the when we've been looking at what options are available to properties. Some of our tenants um, in their current way of living have have chosen to have room temperatures which are higher than 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 we could provide um, uh, through um, through using um, um, a, 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 a air source heat pumps for example uh, and you know, ten, some of the tenants have preferred to have higher temperatures um, uh, you know, for a short period of time through using fires and traditional radiators um, rather than the, the, the lower levels of more consistent heat through low service temperature radiators. And I think we need to have, you know, we need to have a discussion with tenants uh, and individuals about what their expectations are for, for, from the heating profile from their homes. And so, so, so they're recognising that it will not be the same moving forward they may have to change their expectations as well. And in fact, that's probably a better example than what I came up with earlier uh, in, in, a, in response to Councillor uh, Cohn's um, question. Um, coming back now to Councillor Behart's, Behart's uh, pro, um, questions about, uh, about um, knowledge and use of heating systems. Thank you. I think that's an excellent suggestion in making sure that we, we make sure that the information that we have um, is more easily available. Um, what we um, are doing is that, that we're um, putting together a couple of job descriptions at the moment 
um, for officers whose whose main role will be to offer people money and any money advice, including um, any energy advice on how how best to to keep their their homes warm, and certainly you know information um, uh, on that arising uh, from that can be uh, disseminated to a wider number of people. Uh, and some of the work that you know, I mentioned that I'd, I'd, I'd come out of um, uh, scoring the tenders for the repairs contractors, a number of the repairs contractors um, have suggested uh, ways of including uh, energy advice to tenants as part of the part of the future repairs contract. Uh, and, and we need we, we'll need to, to strengthen that. Um, I think I've tried to cover everything, but if I miss something out, can you just remind me, please? Thank, thank you, thank you very much. I think there was um, Councillor Martin Khan just had a very specific question about the um, the housing stock described, including the aluminium. Housing oh yes, so, sorry, yes, I did, I, I did miss that, and and that's that's more of a case of I've got really poor handwriting rather than trying to dodge the question on this occasion. Uh, um, I. I started to describe the way that our stock condition survey um, would be something that was more specialised rather than just a standard survey. Um, and that would be particular value for, um, for the, uh, for the non-traditional properties. So we would need to look um, carefully at those with the stock condition survey uh, and seeing what's, what's worked um, better um, elsewhere in the country. Uh, and that can be some, you know, sometimes it, it has resulted in demolition. Sometimes it's uh, enveloping the properties with a more thermally efficient cladding, et cetera. So I'm not going to answer the question now because we don't have the data available in order you know, that I can make an informed response. But what we will do is to make sure that, that we pay particular uh, a, a attention uh, to those properties during the stock conditions survey and moving forwards. Uh, and as if we suspect, those properties are particularly challenging, and they have high uh, high running costs. Um, I hope the you know, the committee would agree those are exactly the sort of properties that we should be making a priority moving forward. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, if you'd allow me, Peter, I just want to to pick up on on two things and sort of come back a little bit. Sure. But, but um, one, it's it's fascinating to hear about how you're you're building in this in terms of contracting officers who would include this advice you know as, as part of the the service that's that's being provided and you're looking at within procurement of um you know repairs contractors i think that's that's just huge and i don't know if that's something that you've done previously in your your other work and examples or that's something you know but given the current context and climate as we're hit, going into this period now that just seems to be absolutely huge and probably hitting more parts of the country than ever be, you know before in a long while so um but so i'm just thinking as well in terms of often we we are looking for best practice to provide to the lga um you know to to share with other councils so that's one i think that could it may be that this is common practice but you know it'd be really good to hear um if that is a an opportunity to share this or reshare but then and secondly would be to come back to the um the issue of the stock condition survey and kind of a recommendation I'd like to to make and that is you know as I understand you're planning at the moment to commission this you have the funding it's in the budget to be able to commission the, the type of survey that you're talking about which is the bespoke one um, and that the results would be there by, by here by the end of 2022 um, what I expect is over this year is that there are very likely to be funding pots coming out of the government around retrofitting between COP26 and COP27. Um, so it's just knowing that we're, we're in a good place to be able to be seen as an eligible council that's you know ready to be able as a good um, yeah a, a good applicant for some of those kind of pro, um, funds that will probably be coming out. Um, so knowing that the results would come in at the end of 2022 but you know not losing sight of perhaps having some interim information including this asset management strategy that we could use as a hook if we were to go for some of that funding yeah and and and, and certainly that that's the plan uh, and when we appointed the uh, the the service manager for asset management Eddie Spicer 
um, yeah. one of the skills that we look like during, uh, looked at during the appointment was somebody who who, who had uh, who had skills uh, in obtaining funding for, uh, for for climate issues. So I think we're we're not in the best position because we're we're still lacking data. But we are we are in a strong position that that we were a few months ago uh, without Eddie. Uh, and Ed is already suggesting improvements that we can make the survey to increase the likelihood of success of future funding. Uh, and as I say, uh, as part of the um, uh, repairs tender, we're having you know, we, 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 we're clear that the, the new contractors uh, we, we, uh, will assist in that. I just make it clear that the 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 officers that we're, we're talking about. And you, you, you mentioned earlier about uh, a, a joined up approach. The officers that we're um, talking about um, really have come across, um, uh, we're considered them as a consequence of, of the, the pandemic. So we recognise that there are not only a number of people who have become homeless, and we've got a you know, statutory responsibility to help those people, but in in reality, there'd be a, a, a much larger group of people who've um, depleted their savings and now are in greater peril if they have, a, if they have another crisis in, in, their, in their lives of, of, of losing their homes. So the, 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 um, the prompt has, has come from present, uh, of preventing homelessness uh, during COVID. And when we started talking about uh, the impacts of you know, what was needed and money advice, actually, you know, saving money uh, money on energy was a very obvious fit. So I, you know, <laughs> I'm emphasising the the energy saving role in this committee, but it's part of a, a, a overall approach. Um, to make sure that that, that we have a, a a better advice service um, to avoid to, to you know try to help uh, more vulnerable residents uh, um, having crisis in crisis within their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and and it is key. And and you know, I think most of us and all of us probably here in in the committee really do feel that. Mm. That's what this is all about, really. This community—it it is also about the social implications, you know, of yes. climate change and environment. It, it is about um, health and welfare too. So, if I would like to summarise, perhaps you know, um, some of the comments that we would make to this, um, before also just agreeing with members that you know we would recommend to cabinet that um, you know this be approved by them as an asset management strategy. The things that I've heard that we would you know, like to you to take into account, um, albeit, albeit you have underlined in yellow some of the things within the report, I think the, the two that mentioned by um, Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, which is also around in terms of surrounding areas, in terms of biodiversity um, being there, especially within the pandemic. I don't know if I didn't see that underlined in yellow. It may be there, Peter, and you can um, do it, but the biodiversity, um, for mental and physical welfare um, and the prioritization of the homes in terms of fuel poverty. Also recommend that on page um, 11, I think it is, which is the impact, page 10, the climate um, implications of this report. I would just really like to see that, that beefed up, you know, in the way that we've described, um, as to be an exemplar as well about how a strategy can show in an integrated way, what impacts it does have for climate change. Um, and also that you do say linkages for the labour and skills you talk about. So the local college could be, um, I think you're saying, to become a training hub. Um, but also like to recommend that we do quite early on um, link up with the apprenticeships and the skills training hubs at the um, combined authority level and GCP level. I think that would be really important too. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing the results of the stock condition survey. That will thank lead you to very much. Decisions. Yeah, thank you much, your input. So I think that, members, that, would you all question. agree that that's the, the recommendations we have and recommend to cabinet that, that goes with? Thank you so much once again for a huge piece of work, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, members, and we new, move on to um, item number six: future parks accelerator. 
and Rob Pierce. Uh, are you with us, Rob? I am. I'm here. Hello. Thank you. Yeah. And for anybody who's who's watching, you can explain what the accelerator is, the future parks. But I understand that you're going to really give us a um, a helpful introduction to what's happened during that that project. And obviously, Councillor Martin Khan has been um, a part of that too. I'm sure we'll hear from him. Thank you, Rob. I'll I'll just share my screen so I can get that going um, before I give a little bit of an introduction. I'll find the right one. Can everybody see that? Is that OK? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah, good. Right. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you said, my, my name is Rob Pearce. I'm uh, Programme Director of the Cambridge and Peterborough Future Parks. Now, I know some of you know a little bit about the programme. But I'll just give you a, a quick piece of background. So, as you said, Councillor Khan is involved, and also John Cornell, as an officer, I think, is on this call, is, is the officer representative. It is a cross Cambridgeshire and Peterborough HLF and um, H, uh, MHCLG, Ministry of or Leveling Up, as it's now called, funded project. It uh, started about two years ago, and its main aim was to look for a sustainable future. For parks across the whole of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough and in that sense uh, it is quite a complex project uh, it involves all the local authorities so all the districts Peterborough City Council Cambridge County Council combined authority and the local nature partnership and Neen Park are all major partners in the project um, and as such what I'll be doing today is giving you an update of where we've got to but quite an important point because as we come to the end of the project, which will probably end in July this year, the number of things we're putting forward, like the Active Parks Unit, which we'll talk about today, that will require the support of all those partners. Uh, and there's a combined authority meeting at the end of January uh, where the mayor's provided his support. But of course, the, the proposal, which we'll get to at the end of this project in terms of the financial backing will require the combined authority to agree to that. And I'll, I'll get to the point uh, where the, the shares amongst all the current partners uh, are set out in, in the slide uh, at the end as well. But what I want to do principally is give you an update where we've got to the major things that are coming out of it. And as I say, these have been shaped by considerable input from all the partners. Uh, as I said, Councillor Khan's been on the nominated member steering group. John's been involved in the project team as well. Before I start, I know there's going to be too much information on these slides. Um, and particularly, I'm now just seeing where the, your screen is, that they've been quite difficult to see anyway. But what I'm hoping to do is make the main points. Um, myself, and obviously Councillor Khan and John, are very happy to take any more questions after today's meeting and fill you in on what is quite a complex project. Um, and so I know there's going to be a lot of information, but I should try my best to summarise it as we go along. So uh, I will move forward. So I'll give you a little bit of background and and pardon me, I, I will move quickly through these slides and just make the main points. But as I said, you'll have them and you can come back with any further uh, clarifications and uh, questions uh, after this. I'm quite happy to do that. It's one of nine, we're one of nine areas across the country all have a slightly different flavour in terms of what the Heritage Lottery Fund and National Trust were seeking to find out our particular flavour in Cambridge and Peterborough was looking to what collective leadership models can be created to, to give uh, a good sustainable future to the areas or the counties, parks and green spaces. Um, the themes around the national programme, it is a national programme, uh, we're looking at those kind of eight main areas. And our focus, I suppose, has been around new partnerships and new governance models but particularly new ways in which we can use parks to support health and well-being, to support nature restoration, and how we can work in a, well, what is a three-tier area necessarily in order to support those parks and the different roles those partners can play. Um, so a little bit of background about uh, where we start. And I say this program is about two years old. Um, like everybody else, we've been impacted by the pandemic. So we have an extension to the end of July. We're probably not where we need to be, but you know we're putting our best foot forward to work with our partners to see how much we can deliver before we have to hand it back to the structures that we've created through this project, one of them being the Active Parks Unit. So the overall vision was to look for that sustainable future by creating a joined up approach. And the opportunities um, were how we can 
uh, seek to position parks to improve health, to tackle climate change. But the big one there is at the top as well that came along obviously after the project got started and that was responding to COVID-19. And obviously everybody's relationship with parks changed over the various lockdowns and everybody became to realize, you know, the valuable, how valuable parks are and how they do contribute to our health and well-being, can contribute to nature and to climate change. So people began to see parks in a different light, I think. Um, and obviously where you are, responding to growth was one of the biggest challenges as well for parks and green spaces. And I'll say a bit more about that as we go. The outputs we're looking for from the project were what kind of collective leadership uh, could put us in good stead for the future? How do we bring a kind of sense of a planning for the whole of Cambridge and Peter? And I mean planning with a small p in that respect to give our parks uh, and place our parks and open spaces uh, uh, in the best possible light. And are the new models of delivery uh, that will help us deliver better outcomes? Um, I won't go into that as far too detailed as I know, at least to say, to make the point, complex project, huge range of cross-sector interests. So not least the um, local authorities involved, but you, interests from the environment sector, from the nature sector, from the volunteer sector, from the community and voluntary um, organization sector, particularly from health, uh, from developers. So we had this huge range of stakeholders to engage with, which we did through a co-design process in 2021. Uh, but it helped us start to design some of the outputs that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, that'll give you some idea of some of the organisations right across the patch that we've dealt with. Um, I won't, again, I won't go into any of the detail here, but it was quite extensive, the consultation and engagement in this kind of co-design. Very difficult under these circumstances, as you can imagine, in this kind of way of communicating with people. But again, we had to do our best. And this slide really gives you the kind of sense of where that took us to. So trying to boil the messages down through that process where the people wanted us then to focus on how can we add value at a Cambridge and Peterborough scale, but respect local diversity and dependence. All the districts and Peterborough deliver parks and open spaces in different ways. Some are outsourced, some are insourced, some are delivered by the private sector, some are as you, where you are, a lot of parishes are involved. And partners are very clear they want us to respect that, but they're also very clear that actually there's a lot of value where we could work together that could be curated. And there are a lot of common priorities around health and well-being, around building community resilience by encouraging uh, volunteering, looking at common approaches to nature restoration, and of course contributed to climate change and where parks could play a role in that. Central one, of course, where people wanted to work together was around responding to COVID-19 and a green recovery. And there are a number of themes that, that were very particular to everybody about wishing in the future to work collaboratively and in cooperation, seeing parks as a wider system uh, and parks, nature and people are no respecter of borough boundaries. Um, and so, you know, we need to recognise that and being something we could work with as well in designing uh, our approach into the future. So those are the principles with which we work with to start to shape some of our outcomes. Uh, and again, too busy to, to, to go through these uh, in any detail, but hopefully you can um, use these at your leisure and come back with some detailed questions. The points I would make on collective leadership, looking at these three principles, one of the models that we've come back to again and again was the recap model or the recycling partnership, which I guess many of you will be au fait with and how there um, elected members and all the um, authorities work very closely together. Where is the where there is a common aim and where they can see they can create common value in order you know, to achieve better recycling and environmental outcomes. The same approach we're beginning to develop now around parks and obviously then it can be applied to the natural the wider natural environment where you need collaboration across those different tiers of government particularly and outwards into the health system and outwards into uh, the local nature system as well local nature partnership in order to achieve some of those outcomes because you can't achieve them by yourself as a, a single unit 
Uh, and in terms of model for delivery, that's where we started to build things, where we saw we could curate some value that was useful to everybody, whilst I say that respects that local diversity. And one particular aspect of that is the active parks unit, which will be central to what I'm talking about today. And lastly, which we're still working on uh, at this moment, is actually how then to reflect that in a flexible plan so people can see how parks work as a whole system across Cambridge and Peterborough, but people actually can look after them in their own ways in which they see important and fit, but come together where they know they can create value on them uh, and work together to improve those outcomes around health, around nature restoration, around community resilience. So they were the watchwords we did. Uh, I'll say a little bit now more about the case for the Active Parks Unit, because that's where people have come together and put in a collective bid with the combined authority to the mayor in order to support what comes after FPA. Um, uh, obviously, you, you know, I won't go into any detail on this slide, but you probably can't see it on that large screen. But as you'll probably witness through the, you know, the last 18 months, people have begun to view parks and begun to use different ways of valuing the outputs of parks, particularly around natural capital. Um, so we can put a number on now, the value of parks, particularly in health and well-being, in terms of carbon sequestration, in terms of some of the other services or benefits that have always been there. Um, and that really we want to start to use and enable people to use more and when they think about how they develop park the parks and open spaces into the future. Because historically, and as you'll know, you know, as, as a district council and many other councils have had to be very challenged in terms of their resource allocation over the last few years. The only way often we, uh, people have treated parks is in how much they cost. And actually, I think the debate is now moving, particularly across the country, as I work, you know, a, a lot outside of a lot, many of the authorities, changing that debate from how much they cost to actually what value can they curate, and that's what we're working on now. These are some of the issues, obviously, that are Cambridge and Peter specific. Some of them are very relevant to, to obviously South Cams in terms of the population and growth and the impact of development, but obviously other issues like health inequalities. Uh, are pertinent to other areas of, of the county as well. Um, also, I'm sure in terms of inequality and deprivation, there are patches everywhere. How parks can support tackling some of those issues uh, is really important. Again, we wanted to shape our outcomes in that. Part of our work on which we haven't finished yet is actually then using natural capital to put a value on parks. And just the headline there, that every year, uh, or parks provide benefits about of worth about £375 million pounds per year. If you put a value on mental well-being, physical health, and carbon sequestration, um, we are this is this piece of work isn't finished yet because what we want to do is add to that the values that we can put on in what they call other um, nature-based solutions or ecosystem services and get a full picture of the natural capital map of Cambridge and Peterborough, including South Cams, so people can understand then where the values lie and what they mean in terms of how their existing parks and green spaces work, but actually how their, very, how their new parks and green spaces may work as well. Um, and there's a graph that actually shows where these initial values are spread across the districts. And of course, South Gam's got very high values there, uh, reflecting the extent of green space out there. Um, well, as I've mentioned already, we did this, this very wide consultation, but the strong message is coming back from both the health community but also the voluntary sector for community. We're very much, yeah, the key thing we want is actually to support parks and green spaces and make sure they can deliver some of those benefits and capture some of those benefits is much greater coordination and integration. Health, of course, is delivered, uh, it's a, a county scale and Peterborough scale. Lots of the voluntary sector organisations are saying, yeah, we don't know what left, right hand doesn't know what left hand is doing. What we do is, is can we have some way of coming together to increase our capacity, to learn from each other, to in come together, to increase the number of uh, volunteer groups or friends groups, et cetera, and learn from each other and grow those across the park. So they are the kinds of things that we wanted to work with when creating the Active Parks Unit as well. The final thing, and I, again, I won't dwell on this slide, is around collective leadership piece. Um, and Martin is involved, as I said, in the nominated members group. We want to see that as FPA starts to wind up towards the summer, how do we make sure that that group is built upon and actually can start to behave and act on 
where there is common interest in environmental policy that goes beyond the district boundaries. Uh, and that's likely to be things like nature recovery strategies, strategies, approaches to natural capital, developing environmental policy, which of course, you know, often may be done at combined authority level or at county level or even wider spatial levels. But how do you create the mechanisms then? How do you build on, I think, what we've curated in order to help people do that and continue to do that? Um, so a little bit about the active parks unit. Um, so we want to pilot it. Um, its key, key functions, I guess, will be some of those integrating, activating and animating parks for the, to deliver concrete outcomes around public health, around communities and around nature. And so those units at the moment uh, uh, that sit within the county council, but actually work locally, we want to give the, an active parks unit to pull on those strings, work with those uh, units and actually give them much more focus around parks and open spaces locally. So give you some examples. So with public health, and we're working through this moment, we want to see more public health spending uh, directed in, in, through existing and future programs at parks and open spaces, but actually tailor that to local circumstances. So again, working with your community development officers and through Think Communities, making sure that they work on the ground to develop those opportunities, not just around inactivity through public health, through social prescribing with the link workers, making sure that those link workers can find the opportunities that run on parks and open spaces, the, you know, and find those providers that deliver some of those programs that actually lots of GP practices are looking for now in terms of green prescribing or social prescribing. And finally, no, um, nature recovery, wherever the nature recovery responsibilities fall, um, looking at the, uh, the opportunities that parks can provide to deliver some of that benefit as well. Um, and at the moment, we're going through quite a large um, natural capital mapping exercise to supplement the maps are already done with you know, a very fine grained look at around where all the natural um, uh, capital assets are and the ecosystem services are right down to field level, particularly obviously a view from our perspective as parks around where they sit in and around parks. But obviously those resources will be useful to all partners because they won't just be there looking at uh, public facing or oh, sorry, uh, publicly accessible parks and green spaces. They will be covering the whole landscape as well. And um, that'll give you some more idea about uh, the kinds of things that we're looking for the active parks unit to do, working very closely, obviously, with uh, colleagues in all of the districts and all of those partners. Um, you know, the core message, I suppose, to me about the Active Parks Unit is about doing something concrete to realise those benefits. So we can all talk about and even value the health and wellbeing benefits, the nature, rest benefits, nature restoration benefits. What it needs is concrete action to actually go and capture those and make sure those larger programmes are beginning to use parks and open spaces uh, to capture some of those benefits that, that we know are there. Um, I was reminded, I was, I was interested to see that the climate change report that, that came through, through via the, the Combined Authority mentioned parks and green spaces 60 times, but there isn't one single concrete action around capturing some of the benefits it makes, uh, uh, it, it, it uh, uh, comments on in terms of parks and open spaces. So that's why we're working again with the Combined Authority and all the partners to create, we hope, this active parks unit. Uh, there are some of the, the functions that we're beginning to think about it will um, uh, provide. Again, this is a kind of work in progress. Uh, we'll be looking to uh, deploy it from April. So this is a, an ongoing uh, development uh, and working across partners to make sure that works. So I wanted to get to the end very quickly again about providing some space for uh, a discussion around some of the issues that I'm sure you'll have around South Cambridge. But I just wanted to mention a bit around the mapping. And now, again, uh, the maps don't really lend themselves uh, to this kind of presentation. But those red lines, if you can just make them out uh, within this diagram, show where your major development areas are. And this is shows where the, the um, uh, the standards uh, for accessibility around some of the green space get people to. So the orange, uh, the purple ones are kind of informal parkland and the meeting you know, open space um, are obviously quite limited in terms of access to people around them. Um, and so those 
uh, pressures I can imagine within the development zones to get the right amount of green space is going to be something that's obviously uh, important in terms of your planning policy uh, and going through and happening at this very moment in time. Um, one of the things we will be doing in early 22 is looking at developing maps then across the whole of Cambridge and Peterborough to start to look at where does natural capital and some of those benefits sit, particularly in relation to other socioeconomic indices. Um, and so some of the pink areas here show where a high population is, but actually low access. Um, and you begin to see that's Cambridge in the middle. Some of the smaller areas there where there's limited access, but high population. Um, what we want to do is begin to overlay some of these things uh, with health inequality, with deprivation, uh, as well as seeing where the multifunctional benefits of green space can be and where they are relative to existing and potential new green space. So we begin to look at priorities, particularly for activity around the active parks unit. So that is an ongoing piece of work as we work through. On the volunteering side, we're developing a pathway to, to support volunteering across Cambridge and Peterborough uh, and you know, to uh, support existing uh, initiatives across all the districts and working with the infrastructure bodies uh, uh, that exist across Cambridge and Peterborough. Uh, I, do, I just should include this as quite an interesting and nice um, way of seeing a walk in the park about supporting people to begin to get groups together, to start to volunteer from what it is takes to get started. Rob, we just need yeah, to sure. sort of wrap, to get us into the conversation, yeah, the discussion a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I'll zip through. Uh, actually, perhaps I'll finish there, Chair, because I just wanted to, I had this slide at the end. The only slides after it then are around the contributions that will go to the combined authority uh, that are shared. But perhaps I'll stop there, Chair, um, and leave those on the slide. Because I think some of these are the issues that are pertinent to, to South Cambridgeshire. Obviously, there's the access to new green space. Um, I've talked a little bit around responding to COVID-19 and, and then the role of the Active Parks Unit were developing. Um, uh, then utilising the natural capital mapping work, which we're going through in order to assist all areas then about uh, how they secure some of the benefits and particularly around nature restoration, as well as health and well-being, as well as climate change. The final thing I would say, that another piece of work which is ongoing is around stewardship and looking at uh, what is a good model for stewardship um, and, and working across all their partners again uh, and all the stakeholders to see the very many different ways stewardship is developed, particularly for new space, and what are the good ways and best ways of de developing, because we know from, from our consultation that uh, there's some great stuff out there, but actually in terms of stewardship of news places, there, you know, there's some stuff that actually could be improved as well, or you know, the practice could be improved as well. So sorry, Chair, yeah, that's a very, very rapid uh, run through. Thank you, Thank you. very comprehensive, and it'll be excellent to see the, um, to, have a, to, to receive the slides as well, be able to look at them in a bit more depth. And we, we did want to be able to have not just to note the report, but also just have a bit of a conversation around it, which is why it's important to have, have yeah, this time, sorry. Robin. So we've just got quite a meaty agenda today, so it's not that we're wanting to um, diminish. So I'd like to call on Councillor Martin Khan, first of all, if you'd like to share anything, and especially if you want to put that, you know, those issues that were just raised there, if you think any of which we would sort of, you think we should be prioritising in particular, Martin. Um. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been very interesting. I mean, for start, it's uh, the it, it was a difficult project because of so many issues were brought in together. It was um, so it was difficult to, to to define exactly where you were uh, you were directing. Um, but the comparison, the information that's been brought up is particularly useful, and the the, the it's been very helpful um, uh, to look at different uh, the way different management. Works. I mean, one of the interesting fa factors that affects South Cambridgeshire, which came out to me, was the fact that we were uh, it came out to be the only, basically, the only local authority in the uh, district in the whole of the area which doesn't have a parks department. Um, we, we seem to outsource all, all, all our management to, to the parishes, or the one one actual facility we've got, Milton Country Park, is actually um, managed by another body for, on our behalf. Um, and this actually, I think it has emphasised the importance of actually having at least some, some 
involvement in-house uh, to do with this because you need to have a champion within house if you're going to, to take these matters forward. Um, so I think uh, the active parts unit is one way forward at a central level, but I think we need to look at how we take this role on uh, ourselves, what role we, how we think we're going to manage it in, in our area. Are we going to take a more active role? Do we want to have people in-house who are responsible for sort of driving policy and action in this field or not? We, we've opted out for some, I don't know when, but it's quite a long time ago now. Uh, um, we sort of opted out of that role and, and um, that has had an effect, I think, upon activities in that field and I think we want to think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Peter Payne. Thank you, Chair. That was a, a very interesting um, introduction to this. Um, it, it seems to me that the important principles here are that we do build on previous initiatives, uh, but we integrate this with various other initiatives. There are many different initiatives going on that could contribute to this. And that also at a more local level, we use the opportunity to link up the very important green spaces and parks that we have, not only for biodiversity, so local report stuff and so on, but also for, for people, for accessing them and ensuring that people from the, the parishes, the villages in particular, can easily get access to those um, superb green spaces that we have in places. I'm lucky I represent Shelford Ward where we have, of course, Wandlebury and um, Gog Magog and a prospect of a new country park as a part of a, a rather contentious um, retirement village where the inspector has uh, uh, overruled us at appeal. Um, the particular initiatives that I was thinking, you mentioned briefly regional parks. I wasn't quite sure how those would fit within the model of delivery. There, has been, there have been attempts to do that in the past under the green infrastructure strategy 10 years ago now, which was a very good initiative, but of course that was at a time of regional strategies. Developing regional parks without that is, is very difficult. Um, I recall John Prescott's visit to um, Coton Countryside Park in 2003 when he announced he was going to give them lots of funds to create the basis for a regional park there. It never quite transpired and it was never going to be regional clearly. Um, some other initiatives that I thought would be worth uh, looking at, and forgive me if these are already taken account, I'm sure they are, but clearly I couldn't read all the, the detail. Um, so we have, for instance, uh, a proposal which was first raised in the 1980s has recently been revived in Cambridge for the, the so-called Great Cambridge Park. Um, I don't know whether you've come across that, but uh, it's a, a very useful initiative led by a number of architects and landscape architects in the area. Um, and then we have um, also, there was, a, I recall, an invitation from DEFRA as part of the National Tree Strategy in 2020 uh, for local authorities to take part in creating further community forests. There are some successful community forest initiatives in this region, and they were offering uh, assistance to create community forests in and around towns and cities. Uh, not something that we in South Cairns were able to really take up at the, the time, but which might be an opportunity at a, at a county level and of course that is based on cooperation with they're talking about you know perhaps 20 percent tree planting so it's not just about tree planting at all that's often misunderstood but based on cooperation with landowners which will be crucial and working with other initiatives um, things like the ELMS schemes which are starting to emerge um, and I think many more landowners partly for lack of traditional basic payments will be inclined to take those up um, and I hope we can uh, we can build on that um, I think um, th there are opportunities there to link with with other initiatives which I hope we will be able to take up and which I, I I've no doubt you've taken into account in, in drawing this up but I think the the key point I would make is the need to integrate all the various initiatives that are going on Sometimes there are so many different initiatives going on that it can be quite confusing and difficult for parishes and others to know how to link them and, and volunteers to know how to link into this. Um, and I think this project could be a real opportunity to take that forward. 
Chair, shall I just respond very quickly to, to those two points? Chair, do I have time? Yes, of yeah. course. Yes, please. Sorry, do. Yeah. Um, just on the regional uh, park point. Um, no, I, don't, I you know, I, I think what I was trying to get over is yeah, to what 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 we're trying to argue is for people to see the parks as a, a kind of set of infrastructure. But you know, we're not saying it needs a and then a, a regional governance structure that goes with that, because actually we can create the partnerships that are flexible. That actually want to see that parks, you know. As I said, people and nature are no respecter of boundaries. The parks can see that the connections between them all, you know, is a good thing for people in terms of active travel. It's a good thing for nature in terms of nature restoration. So trying to get over that sort of view of parks across Cambridge and Peter being a kind of a, a key piece of infrastructure, if you like, almost as important as roads and other things. And we need to make sure that we look at them in that way. So no, not a regional park, although You'll have seen in other parts of the country, people are very interested in this kind of national park city approach, which again isn't a formal or legal entity, but a way of seeing parks, you know, as a network, and people can exploit them and enjoy them in that way as well. Um, your second point, I think, I absolutely agree with, and I, I, what I've found through this project particularly is what this project's done is kind of fill a, 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 a leadership vacuum around spatial envi environmental policy at a Cambridge and Peterborough scale, whilst we've been very focused on parks. As you say, there's a lot of other related environmental issues that can really only be thought about and engaged with at scale that you know weren't being. And actually by bringing all those local authorities together and those partners and the wider set of stakeholders, at least we've begun those conversations where they hit and touch parks. But as you quite rightly say, there's a whole other sort of area of environmental policy, which I would hope some of the governance structures we have created after we've gone can be further developed and pushed forward and managed in a way and make sure that it's got political and accountability input into it, but a wider uh, set of stakeholders input into it as well. Thank you very much. And Councillor Graham Cohn. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I just had a, a quick point, actually, um, sort of building on what Councillor Peter Fain had um, talked about, um, and some of the things that my residents bring up about, um, you know, sort of parks, open spaces, nature reserves, and, and so on. Um, uh, in in the Fendit and Fulborn Ward, we're very also very lucky to be close to the um, uh, Gogs, and um, we have Fulborn Nature Reserve. And uh, we saw those get a lot more popular during the um, pandemic with people um, using them for uh, exercise and, uh, you know, those uh, people that, you know, don't have gardens and so forth, you know, using those spaces um, a, a lot more. Um, I, I suppose as a councillor, I am guilty of when I think about sort of like access and transport, you know, I normally think about that as sort of linking my residents to um, industrial zones or places of employment or city centres and stuff. I, I think less about, um, you know, linking my residents to mm. open spaces via um, public transport or uh, uh, decent cycle links and, and so forth. So I think... Uh, you know that is definitely something worth thinking about. You know, for for councillors. Um, another thing that my residents raise sometimes is that as those areas get more popular, um, my mailbox goes up with complaints about the fact that um, there's people travelling to those areas. So you get um, additional parking, littering, um, some antisocial behaviour sometimes because. You know, they're, they're just being sort of more wide, widely used. And understandably, those beautiful areas, people want to come from distant villages to, to use those uh, spaces, which obviously is a good thing. We want them used and we want people enjoying them and exercising in, in, in this. It's just that sort of, you know, uh, planning and thinking about how the access and how accessible they're going to be, you know, within the local community, I suppose. So I, I, I was, it's not really a question. I was just, you know, you've got me thinking about a couple of things there um, locally. 
Well, just two very two, two quick comments uh, in response. Yeah, I mean, linking with transport and active travel apps. I mean, that's why we we will hopefully make you make the impression on the combined authority that parks and green spaces are also should be seen as this integrated set of key assets that deliver you a huge amount of value and benefits and therefore making sure when you're doing your transport planning you actually take into account how you enable people who may not have a car who may not be able to access it normally can access you know the green space they need to and on your popularity absolutely it's double-edged sword um, and that's where perhaps it's councillor carr's point about the management of spaces you know, and being able to coordinate and manage spaces across in the whole area becomes important about, you know, those types of policies in terms of access, uh, in terms of car parking, etc. And, you know, double edged sword in terms of if you want people to benefit. Um, but actually, yeah, overuse can be a problem. Thank you very much, Rob. And um, so I would just like to make a, you know, a couple of comments and one, I think it's, um, you know, as Councillor Martin Khan and also as John Cornell on the call said, it's, it's really important, as you've been saying, that this work continues. So it's good to hear about the Active Parks Unit. As I understood, I asked a few questions before today's meeting that, um, you know, the Council has contributed towards some of the costs that, you know, enable that admin costs of that unit to go forward, as each of the participating councils have done. So I'm glad that's been done so painlessly, and it's just, yes, that's that's key to, to moving forward. And I'd like to go back to Councillor Martin Khan's point about having a champion. So I invite John, who's on this call as well, um, also to think about, and perhaps we can come back to the committee at some point, you know, how do we champion this? And I think that's a really important point going forward. You know, who, we have elected members, we have officers as well, especially within a council like we, where we don't have a parks unit, and perhaps it would be parks and green space. And I think that leads to my second point is, you know, within South Cams, we know what the, the pressures are here within South Cams. Most of our villages, um, you know, res residents for, for where I am, for example, feel that we do have access to green space. But what we have come to realise for, that that's, that is arable land, that's private land, you know, that's in, you know, mm. around us, where there is huge development pressure, and that could be cut off, you know, quite quickly. And so it's about that mosaic of being able to show in planning terms as well, I think your natural capital work that you were talking about, because we have to balance public benefit, you know, over, over harm of some things. And mm. if we can value what mm. green space means to us, we know that green belt actually isn't about this. It's about protecting us from sprawl, you know, from urban sprawl and between Cambridge. But actually, if we can really understand what the value as well in terms of public benefit that you mentioned, quantifying not only mental and physical health, but also those other values of ecosystem provision that you mentioned. I think that could be hugely useful to, to all of us and into lots of those local plans. And we know that local green spaces through the neighborhood plan is also a very powerful tool, but it needs to be um, justified. And, and it's by getting those kind of quantification of the values, giving examples of that, that local communities can demonstrate you know, how important those spaces are to them when justifying the designation as a, a local green space, a protected amenity. Because it's that mosaic of green spaces around existing settlements as well as providing for them in the new settlements. And your slide up there, you know, I'd like to see that in more detail, which shows, you know, what the pressures are and whether or not we're really ensuring that there is green space provision for the new settlements too. But we mustn't forget the ones that are already here and could lose what a sense of a walk around the field when that suddenly that field is changed in terms of land use change that you've lost that access so i think you know it's also about existing places as well as um, new settlements that we need to really think about this and perhaps in south camp in particular it's not just parks it's also parks and green spaces um, because we don't have a huge amount of parks as many other places mm. may have so those are critical little lungs for for all of us so thank you very much for that that report. We note it. I think everybody that's you know, and we definitely do want to see the future of this this going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. And as I said, I make the offer again. If anybody needs any further information, just come by Councillor Khan or John. And not patience at all. We're we're all listening hugely intently, absolutely to that. To that. Thank um, you very thank much. Thank you very much, Rob. Bye. Good. Bye. Um, I understand that in three minutes there will be a fire alarm, and.
It's a test one, so we don't have to leave the chamber, but it will be rather loud. Do we just continue, or do you stop, and what should we do? I mean, it's hard to say, just for the benefit of the live stream, it's hard to say exactly when uh, there will be, that we've just been given a rough time. It should only be for about 10, 15 seconds, and then it should end. Um, but obviously, nothing will be able to be heard during the time of the fire alarm. We won't try and speak through it, at least. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Aaron. Good. And then we move now to item... I think I've an update on the plans regarding electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, Luke, are you with us, Luke Waddington? And before you start, Luke, it's... Can I just say welcome? No, welcome to the climate environment team that there is at South Cambridgeshire. Um, you've been recently um, contracted for this particular role, although we know that you're well known to South Cambridgeshire. But thank you very much for this oral update for an issue that's of huge, huge importance to us. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you for, the, for welcoming me to the, to the team. And um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So um, yes, I'll be providing uh, a short update on the work that officers uh, are doing to identify and deliver opportunities to install um, publicly accessible electric vehicle charge points in South Cambridgeshire, um, as is required by our uh, zero carbon and doubling nature action plan. So um, there's currently several opportunities that have been identified um, for installing public uh, EV charge points um, in the district, uh, which are not, however, these are not yet finalised. So a written report on these projects will be provided in due course uh, once the plans are confirmed. Um, but in the meantime, Yes, we'd like to take the opportunity um, today just to provide uh, a verbal progress update. So um, we're presently focused on investigating opportunities for, for EV chargers uh, just on, on council controlled land uh, within our ownership. Um, however, this, this can present a challenge in that uh, unlike many other local authorities, um, for example, who are installing um, EV chargers in their own um, public car parks, uh, as, as you're obviously all aware, South Cambridge doesn't own, own any of its own public car parks. Um, and this reduces some of the options that are available to us uh, when compared to other, other local authorities trying to do the same thing. Um, although we don't rule out the possibility of installing charges on land that we don't own, um, some of our previous work attempting uh, to unsuccessfully deliver EV charges for taxis uh, underlines how difficult this can be, uh, particularly around dealing with third party landowners, um, which was a key challenge during that project. So that's why the focus, uh, at least for now, is for, is for uh, land within our own control, um, where we have a bit more sort of control over proceedings. Um, so uh, to that effect, by the end of uh, March 2022, we're expecting to have uh, two rapid electric vehicle charge points installed at uh, South Cambridge Shire Hall. Um, and this will be achieved by um, upgrading two of the 20 charge points, which are already scoped into the wider uh, greening of South Cambridge Shire Hall project. Um, however, what these rapid charges will, will do, uh, they'll, they'll be available uh, for taxis and for the wider public uh, rather than just for staff. And so we'll support the transition of uh, local taxi drivers to EVs, uh, particularly following the recent changes to the taxi licensing policy, uh, which are obviously uh, requiring EV uptake within the local uh, taxi trade. Um, but in addition to taxis, they'll also provide uh, rapid charging to staff. So, bit, um, uh, Luke, we just we did have the fire alarm, but probably you didn't hear it because we didn't have our uh, microphone on. So, just if you just repeat that last bit which you said, you know, just the last the last couple of sentences. Yeah, of course. Yeah, apologies, chair. I, I didn't hear that. Sorry. Um, yes. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll start again um, from that from that paragraph. So, um, just talking about the the, the rapid charges in, that will be um, installed at um, South Cambridgeshire Hall, in addition to the the twenty um, charge points that are already scoped into the wider greening project. Um, which will be available to, to taxi drivers and to the wider public, um, as well as for staff, um, to, tr to support the transition of, of local taxi drivers to electric vehicles following the, the recent changes to our licensing policy, um, which are obviously um, requiring EV uptake within the local taxi trade. And, um, and yeah, they won't just be for taxis, as I say, they'll also be for, uh, for, for visitors uh, or anyone else in staff who need to charge their electric vehicles in under one hour. That's a sort of the bonus of, of the, or the benefit of the rapid charges, and obviously particularly for for taxi drivers who need to sort of minimise the amount of time that they aren't they are on the road. Um, so yes, moving moving on to other sort of opportunities um, on our own land, um, there's another opportunity to to an integrate EV charges into an existing um, green energy retrofit project, which is um, currently taking place or will be taking place at a sheltered accommodation scheme at Elm Court in Over. 
Um, so uh, officers are presently working with the contractor and with with colleagues in housing to scope another pair of um, a public charges into this this retrofit project. And um, and similarly to that, there are more potential sites for for more public EV charges that have been identified within um, communal car parks uh, to further three sheltered accommodation schemes. Um, so again, working uh, working to progress these sort of these sort of three pilot sites um, with the housing department. And, and looking to do some resident engagement around that, because obviously that will be an important part uh, for the sort of next stage of that of that particular project. Um, and it's hoped that, um, you know, hopefully if they go ahead, the TV charge points at these locations could provide charging facilities to uh, accommodation residents and their visitors, uh, but also to nearby residents who can make use of them. And perhaps those that don't have their own driveways um, where they can, you know, where they can, so they can't charge at home themselves uh, and to visitors to the villages as well. Um, but obviously, yes, we're also encouraging or investigating opportunities to work with um, with our partners, including the county council, uh, to integrate with some of their projects projects that they've got currently for um, transport infrastructure upgrades, uh, particularly at sort of park and ride sites, which are within our district, um, and also engaging with the the Cambridge and Peterborough combined authority in relation to their alternative fuel strategy uh, to understand what what we at South Cams can do uh, to assist in delivering electric vehicle charging infrastructure in the area. While aligning with the uh, with the combined authority strategy, and um, there's a series of um, the, 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 the combined authority are running a series of, um, of briefings around that strategy um, in the next month or so. So hopefully we'll be able to to work with them in the near future. Uh, and also, as, as some of you may be aware, there's an upcoming uh, fortnight of of climate and environment events, sort of running across the end of February and, and the first week in March. So this can also provide uh, an opportunity for us to encourage uh, parish councils, local businesses, other local organisations um, to think about perhaps installing EV chargers on their own land. Um, as I mentioned, obviously the, the council, we don't have any, uh, South County don't have any public car parks of our own. Uh, so perhaps these groups may be able to uh, supplement electric vehicle charging infrastructure uh, in their own car parks, uh, you know, with assistance from us. Um, and this session as well can also, it'll sort of be a, an introduction to electric vehicle charging uh, providing information on funding, uh, the various sort of uh, funding that is out there, uh, as well as the installation process, and uh, will hopefully be a, a sort of a gauge for us uh, for interesting interest in uh, uh, in EV charging infrastructure among these groups. Um, so that's the end of my update. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luke. Any comments, Councillor Gremko? Uh, just a quick one, Chair. Um, so. Um, am I right in thinking, because we did have a pot of money for um, tax, specifically taxi um, uh, charging, EV charging points, uh, have we lost that funding because we haven't installed the charging points? Luke? Yeah, yes, I can take that. Yes, so that was, um, as far as I'm aware, yes, that, that was a project that was running a couple of years ago that was being led by the city council um, to sort of look at locations for EV charge points for tax, specifically for taxi drivers across um, both our district and across the city as well. Um, but it, it didn't result in any successful sites um, within South Cambridgeshire. There were sites found in city, but but not within uh, within our district um, for various reasons, um, some of which I sort of alluded to, um, but mainly around to working with third party landowners and the difficulties and delays that that that, that brought about um, and also around the the cost of connections to the grid particularly for um, charges that are um, that are going to be of, of use to taxi drivers which are the the rapid chargers um, they're they're significantly more powerful than the sort of standard what's called fast chargers um, and so require you know a greater sort of caliber of connection which which, which in turn brings about um, much higher connection costs so they were some of the the kind of challenges that were encountered uh, and that didn't you know, that resulted then in, in sort of lack of of any um, specific provision in South Cams for taxi charges as part of that that sort of um, pot of money um, and hence why we're sort of looking again um, um, at sort of trying to provide these rapid charges where we can for instance at, at South Cambridgeshire Hall. If I could just just add that the funding didn't need to go back to government because City were able to use that to put um, additional charges in the City, which of course are relevant for our taxi drivers as well, just as clarification. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, 
but obviously we, we were hoping for <laughs> other results as well. But it's, it's a difficult thing. And in fact, I was speaking with the former Minister for Transport um, about on the launch of the Transport Decarbonisation Strategy. And one of the main concerns is that we still don't have any guidelines on who is mandated, you know, across the country to make the strategies, you know, what level of government or whether it's actually private sector or government. There, there is no clarity yet in terms of guidelines. And so I think that that's one thing that we, we still need um, within the national strategy is to know who's responsible for sorting this out. Because, it, it, you know, at the moment it's hot, you know, it's very much um, postcode lottery for, for people and it doesn't help what they... What we saw from the car manufacturing industry was the, the two greatest barriers at the moment to uptake of EV were price and the, the EV charging you know, strategy. So I think it's what we've pushed for, and Siobhan knows this, we've kept saying, let's just do stuff within South Cabs until this is sorted out and not wait for the, the big areas to kind of do it. Let's get as much as we can. So look, it's fantastic that you know, we're just getting ahead and seeing what we can do while, you know, um, while that, that itself is sorted. I have a question then. So we've just had a, a presentation which made me think about it, which is about parks. And so Milton Park, so we do, you know, that, that is ours. So, and people, the thing about charging is it needs to be, if it's not a really rapid one, it needs to be somewhere where you're going to do something while your car is being charged or you create a destination while your car is being charged. And so had you thought, you probably have, but had you thought about Milton Park and the other was the place I was thinking, a bit out of the box, but is our, recycling, waste management recycling um, centres where you, you go and, you know, visit and um, do, which is our, again, exactly whether it's our land or not, but we have, a, have an agreement in terms of leasing that land. So I was just wondering a bit of sort of whether you'd considered those places as well. Uh, thank you. Yes. So um, taking the, the last one first, the, the waste management sites, I, I hadn't, no, um, I, I wasn't completely sure that I, I'd perhaps wrongly assumed that they were kind of the county council's um, sites or they were within their ownership or you know, I, I wasn't sure of what the, the sort of arrangements were around that, but I can I can absolutely look into it, yes. And then um, the other the other point about Milton Country Park. So that was, I believe, looked at for as part of the, the, the taxi drivers um, charges, the rapid charges. Um, and I think from from memory, it, 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 it didn't work for whatever reason. There, um, it may well work for um, for more general charges, for slower charges. Although um, I know that for the funding, for the sort of government um, funding that you can we can potentially access for, um, for 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 public charging, um, does require has access requirements in terms of that being available, you know, twenty four seven. And I'm not sure whether the car park at Milton. I know from using it myself, it sometimes has a barrier across it. Um, so I don't know if you can get a vehicle in there, um, you know, at any point in the day or, or night. Um, but again, it could be something I, I can certainly look into it further. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Jeff Harvey. Um, yes, on a similar theme, I wonder if you looked at the um, ice rink, because I know you mentioned park and ride, but interesting thing about that is it has a um, hugely oversized um, grid connection because they need a lot of power when they freeze the ice, which they don't normally need. So I think it, it normally has about 850 kilowatts of spare grid capacity, which is quite useful for rapid charges, I would imagine. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I've, I've, that's been mentioned to me before, that, that particular location. Um, and I sort of had, had a go at trying to find out who to contact um, uh, about it, and I hadn't really got, got as far as I perhaps liked um, in terms of you know getting getting to speak to someone um, who could actually could help, but um, but yeah, I can I sort of pick that up again um, definitely. Or and if anybody know, knows who, who who may be the right person to speak to about that, then then um, by all means please let me know. But, but yeah, another potentially a good location and and obviously sort of being fairly close to, to Cambridge, but still within our district. So yes, that that could, could with our district close. It's ours. <laughs> and yes, it has it, that and has that extra. Yeah. You know. So Absolutely. yeah, brilliant. Thanks again. Always. Count on Jeff to <laughs> come up with one. So definitely would be great if you pursue this. And again, it's a place where people can 
you know, there you could have the rapid charging, but you could also have the other capacity charging that could perhaps pay for itself in the end, even if we're not looking at the government funding for places where you're going to visit. You know, so you will spend time there, so it's fine if your car's charging at the, at the same time. So um, thanks very much for that, Luke. And, um, and, and be very good once, you know, it will be good, to, I think, to let, as you're saying, during the Climate and Environment Fortnight Week, again, another plug for that, everybody, the Climate and Environment Week, starting on February 21st, um, great events being planned. But yes, I think with parish councils, letting them know as well that, you know, we are looking at that sheltered accommodation scheme. So in those particular parishes, that um, how we get that information out there that those, um, those could be used as well. And of course, they'll be key for taxis and people who are using taxis in those areas. Thanks very much, Luke. And um, we look forward to hearing further updates from you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, members. We now go to agenda item eight. Um, again, which is, features hugely within our agenda pack and is one another one which is eagerly anticipated, which is the biodiversity supplementary planning document that we have. John, John Cornell, hello. Hello. You must, <laughs> must have uh, been quite relieved to have got this far with, with it, following the, the extensive consultation. And, and thank you for all the detail that's provided in this report as well in terms of how the consultation was conducted, what you've done with all of the responses as well, which is... Um, hugely helpful. Do you want to, yes, give us a bit of a, and, and hello Jane, hello Jane. <laughs> the Jane Green Jane, as well. The, so Jane's thank got you. a dash in a, a little while, so uh, I'll, I'll give you a brief update, Pippa. Right. Um, sorry, Chair, excuse me. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll just read you um, just a brief, uh, just do a brief presentation. I don't have any slides. Um, there's plenty to see and um, if, if, if you've got the document available. But um, good afternoon, Chair Members. Um, as I've said, I'd like to briefly update you on where we are with this item. Um, the Greater Cambridge Biodiversity SPD for 2022 uh, and ask, um, if possible, if it could be sent uh, to Cabinet for adoption uh, at the February meeting of Cabinet, I believe, which is on the 7th, uh, because we'd like to use it as a material consideration in the planning and development process for the Greater Cambridge LPA. Uh, the SPD is at the end of a 15 month journey. It started in November uh, 2020 uh, and it was first brought before this committee uh, in draft form in June 2021 prior to the, uh, the public consultation and subsequent amendments. Uh, the SPD consultation ran between July and September 2021 and we received detail and specific and generic uh, feedback from approximately 40 respondents, uh, typically with broad support for a new SPD for biodiversity. Uh, and we've provided you um, in the documents pack with a, a statement of consultation. It's about 219, 220 pages in there, which include all of the responses, but also I, think, I believe there's a track changes version. So you can see uh, for your delight and delectation exactly what has changed because we, there, there were quite a few changes and amendments to the document. Um, so the final draft uh, incorporates guidance on relevant sections of important new legislation, particularly the UK uh, Environment Act 2021, which uh, appeared in November, uh, early November, but also the National Planning Policy Framework from June 2020 And um, those two documents really provide quite substantive uh, amendments to uh, the, the the legal um, guidance on on, on what's uh, what what would expect around things like biodiversity net gain uh, and the like. Um, so while many of the amendments uh, were changes to wording details within the text that we've been you know highlighted by uh, uh, through the consultation, as I've said, the most significant changes came from uh, the publication of the UK Environment Act and the NPPF. Um, probably, as you already know, the most significant change to emerge uh, from the Environment Act was this uh, uh, duty for 10% biodiversity net gain to be placed on uh, all developments, whether they're uh, Town and Country Planning Act or indeed nationally significant infrastructure projects like DCO uh, projects, like, for instance, the, the A428 or the um, Cambridge Wastewater Treatment Plant. So, you know, that possibly quite controversial, but in terms of what we're looking to do, the doubling nature agenda, you know, very good news um, for, for, for us, I think, uh, and, and for, the, for the council and residents of, uh, of our district alike. Um, so the biodiversity supplementary planning document for Greater Cambridge uh, shared planning has 
we believe uh, delivered an accessible, current and accurate planning resource, which will enable developers to plan and deliver schemes uh, with more confidence that they're protecting and enhancing biodiversity than before. Um, the SPD will be used as a tool by local planning authority officers, such as our ecologists and, and others, um, to give a clear steer to developers on, you know, unambiguous steer. This is what you need to do to stay within the regs and to enhance the biodiversity. Um, as well as setting out expectations, you know, there are some expectations in there, a little bit controversial, but we, we did set out aspirations um, for possibly 20% or more higher figure on biodiversity that might come, might come as a, uh, you know, with the new local plan. So we, we think it's a, a clear document. We, we, we think it's, um, uh, obviously it's of its time. Uh, it's something that's been uh, needed for some time. We've, our last SPD was um, over a decade old. Um, so it's, we feel very happy that we've got this, we've brought it to this point now. Uh, we've been through an extensive consultation. The timing of the Environment Act was in the end perfect. We were quite worried that that would be delayed further. And we've managed to get all of that good stuff from the Environment Act into the SPD. Um, I should reiterate that it is an SPD. Um, and therefore, we're not creating any new policy. There's, there's nothing, um, there's no attempts to, to, to sneak anything in. It's guidance. It's a guidance document on existing policy. It just so happens that some of that policy is brand new UK government legislation, which is, is highly relevant. Um, the project, just briefly, um, the project duration, I said, was 15 months. The, the project budget, which we spent, was about £20,000, and that really paid for the, the, consult, uh, the consultant to draft that early version, which we, we sent out for consultation. Um, and officer hours were about 660 when you add up everybody's, uh, everybody's time on this. Uh, that's across about 15 different officers, so it was really a, a multifunctional team that came together. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're very happy to present this to you today and, and hopefully uh, you guys can, can take it forward and we can, we can see it in Cabinet. I would finally note that uh, this SPD was adopted by the Planning and Transport Scrutiny Committee of Cambridge uh, City Council yesterday evening. So we're almost, almost there. Um, and I'll leave you with that. I'm not sure if Jane would like to say anything. Um, Jane's the sponsor of, of the project and I've been the project manager, but as I've said, it's been a, a really multifunctional team and it's been a real team effort to, to produce what we have um, for you today. We can't hear you, Jane, sorry. Apologies. Um, nothing really to add from John's full update there. Um, it's simply to commend it to the committee and hope that you will endorse it um, on its way through to Cabinet. But equally, both of us are here happy to answer any questions any of you may have. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you both, John and Jane. Um, and John, I hope you can stay with us as, as long as you can. I know you've got to rush um, the other agenda items. We're, we're waiting to. Good. Members. Yep. Councillor Graham Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just a, another quick point. Um, firstly, th thanks for the, the report. I think it's very good and there's a lot of information in there. So um, you know, I'll be supporting it going, going to Cabinet in its current form. Um, I just wondered if um, if we looked at sort of the neighbourhood plan stuff within the document, I wondered if there's any way of sort of making it more accessible for sort of community groups, whether that be neighbourhood plan groups, um, you know, parish councils, various different resident groups um, that you know we've talked about already in this this meeting, and looking at housing and, and things like that. Is there any way of sort of summarising or uh, making it more accessible to, to them when they're thinking about sort of biodiversity very locally? Uh, what I would say is that. Um, we will be having a lot of information on the web. We 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 couldn't we, we we had to strike the balance with the SPD document as to what we included and what we didn't. And you probably wouldn't be surprised if I told you that we've had criticisms from both sides. Um, when I say both sides, what I mean by that is folks saying, well, you know, it's just too long, <laughs> it's impenetrable. 
and another saying, oh, it's just, it's, you, you know, there's not enough detail in this. So, so we, we've really tried to strike the balance with, with regard to the content within the document. And so um, I, I hear what you're saying about uh, neighbourhood plans and accessibility, but I would probably suggest that once this thing goes up on the web, um, there will be a lot of ancillary information that goes alongside, and it's probably the, the, the best place to uh, to, to put more accessible neighbourhood plans is probably a standalone items within that website, as opposed to, to you know, doing anything, um, anything more with them in the SPD itself. Did I get that right? Or? The other yeah, thing I'd I, add. Sorry. No, so, sorry. I think you're absolutely right. I think yeah. I think probably what I'm talking about probably sits somewhere else, even you know, outside yep. of the document to keep it sort of more developer focused and getting the key things in there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'll take that on board. I think the other thing I was going to add, Chair, to that is that um, we regularly go to parish forums and uh, residents forums and agents forums, so we have them on a quarterly basis. So the next one that we'll be doing later in, um, in a couple of months, we will be highlighting this to members of, of, of parish councils and bringing it to their attention. And if any of them do want any more help, or, um, be it with neighbourhood plans or anything else, the officers are here to help with that. We've got a dedicated officer in Alison Talkington, and she will then link back in to the respective specialist officers, be it on ecology or any other aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Jeff Harvey, member for Councillor Martin Khan. Yes, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, no, I thought it's a, um, a great piece of work. I, I did read quite carefully through all the um, comments we got for consultation, and I noticed there was um, some concern noted from some of the developers, though not all, about how we would pay for 20% in particular um, biodiversity net gain. And I thought really um, it kind of misses the point because I think this document is really a signposting document in that respect. And, and in that regard, it's, it's performing a useful function because really um, that should long term lead to an adjustment in um, land value, which is, yes. which is the correct thing. And if it turns out to be the case that then, uh, for example, it, typically this would come from agricultural use. If, if um, the farming community would say, well, we, we would rely on that particular land value in order to make our farming business um, viable, well, then that's a completely separate issue which needs to be addressed uh, elsewhere, I would say. So um, I think we've done the right thing to, to signpost this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Councillor Martin Khan. I simply wanted to say yes that it's a, it's a very valuable document. Uh, I don't think it's the sort of bedtime meeting you take to read a social uh, a bedtime. It's I a, did. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, but it's a, it's a it's a technical document which is for the developer to, and you have to therefore cover all the points and meeting sort of lists of sort of criteria to take into account is pretty heavy reading to, to, for for anybody. But but it's but it's essential. So you know, absolutely uh, fulfills the role. Um, I also take the point about it not being uh, only elaborating the detail of existing policy. Uh, obviously, I'd have a lot more comment if I was going to be able to add to the policy, but that's where we are, and that's where we work. And no doubt, once we have a new local plan, we will be looking again at how that, uh, this integrates at that. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, I think it gives a good guidance to the, 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 the developer as to where he needs to go and um, what he needs to do. I should perhaps express a declaration of interest that I, for many years, as a member of the uh, uh, of the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management. I've just, just resigned my membership, but uh, it's mentioned many times in the document, <laughs> so I just bear that interest. Thank you. Chance to be the same. Uh, thank you, Chair. I also very much commend this document, and um, in case it's of concern, I wouldn't be suggesting an additional option under 12 of amending it, because clearly that is not appropriate at this stage. Um, I would just mention the uh, recent report of the inspector in the um, application for the Stapleford Retirement Village. It might seem strange to look at a particular application, but I thought the inspector's comments were quite indicative of an approach by PINs, very much commending the agreed 234% increase in biodiversity on site, of course, resulting from a proposal for a, a country park, which is not something we'll get in every every proposal. Just a, a point that arose there is that um, part of that site is intended to be used for the uh, 
CSET, Cambridge Southeast Transport Busway. And of course, the biodiversity from that might be reduced by, as a result of compulsory purchase, under a planning process which is not one for us, but one for ministers, and there might be no biodiversity um, replacement. Uh, I suspect that there could be, but I think it's important to just bear, bear that in mind. Um, a, a further point, and it's, it's referred to at 7.2, I think the biodiversity net gain on site will be relatively simple in many cases, although difficult to go above 10%, but it will be achievable. The challenge will be where there is a need for biodiversity net gains off-site, and the rules for that, it doesn't seem to me are very clear, certainly in my day job advising farmers, uh, who I think would, whose collaboration would be essential to make this work in many cases, they, they are not clear what they can do other than plant a few trees, and that is, I think, not the sort of biodiversity net gain we're necessarily looking for. And anything we can do to give them clear guidance that they may not be getting from DEFRA from the look of their <laughs> initial publication last week, um, I think would be very helpful to take this forward. Thank you, Councillor Paul Bearpark. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a few points, so uh, just bear with me as I go through these. Um, so the first one is um, relating to the uh, response from the Action for Swifts. So they provided quite a detailed response on question number five, which was about 14 pages long. Um, but it resulted in quite a curt response, um, which just said noted, and some of the wording was amended to reflect the comments. And I thought what they uh, presented was quite a lot of evidence and quite, quite a few examples of good guidance. But it didn't result in a particularly large amount of change to issue five, um, and I appreciate where this is at at the moment, the stage it's at, but I wondered whether there was an opportunity just to revisit their comments to see whether there's um, anything there that... Um, so I'll give a couple of examples. So, for instance, in Issue 5, although, although Issue 5 has been updated to say um, bird box on every house rather than every two houses, it doesn't mention flats. Um, so they had suggested one, one every two flats, but there's no mention of flats. And given that a lot of development going, coming forwards will be flats, I think that could be flats. That could be quite important. Um, they also mentioned um, somewhere else as well in section 549 um, regarding ecological appraisals that it should use the wording in the design and construction SPD, perhaps, or reference that because it was a bit more specific about how to do appraisals. And there may have been other, <laughs> to be honest, I haven't been through their comments in complete detail, uh, in, in entirety, but it would be, I just wondered if it would be worthwhile, given, given, the, um, given the feedback that they provided, whether it's worth another look. Uh, Can I respond to that? Chair. Yes, absolutely, yes. Uh, so, my understanding, I, I'm not sure what version you're looking at, but my understanding is that Guy Belcher uh, got back to Dick Newell um, from Actions for Swift, and that whole section was rewritten and approved by that group, and that went into the SPD. So, um, we, 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 absolutely. That's fine. It was just, it looked like they provided an awful lot, of, you know, a lot of examples and evidence that about good guidance that could go into an SPD. Yeah. But if that no, happens, I, that's fine. I haven't spoken well, to them. Well, so initially, and, and I, I remember this uh, particularly because it was, one of the, um, it was one of the things that we did need to look at again. Initially, our response was to amend, um, but our, our amendments weren't really in keeping with what they expected. So in discussions with the ecologists, uh, we did go back to that group and we have a, a much more substantive change an amendment in the SPD that made it in Council of Air Park so so that was that was addressed good to know I have a okay. couple of a couple of other comments um let me just find the right pages um in biodiversity issue b5 section 554 on page 43 um number three talks about um 
bird boxes on commercial buildings and community buildings. Uh, and it says a minimum of 10 boxes for the first 1,000 square meter footprint and one additional box for every 100 square meters. Yep. Um, I wasn't sure, does, it, does that mean that up to 1,000 square meters, there's no need to put in any bird, bo bird boxes? And when you get to 1,000 square meters, you then need to put in 10. Well, again, uh, that's, that's the guidance we got from Action for Swifts. Um, so what, what we've done is we've taken uh, the best practice, the language from the best practice, and we've put that into the SPD. If, if what you're saying is that's confusing, um, then possibly we, we need to go back and look at that. But, you know, we've, um, we've, we've tried to reflect the best practice that's out there but it seems that you're, it, 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 it is um, it's possibly confusing. Um, I'm, I, I'm not confused when I read that. It looks um, 10 boxes for the first 1,000 square meters, and then one additional for every 100. I, I'm, I'm, not sure why that, I'm not sure why that's unclear. Sorry, could you? Well, I was wondering if it could be simplified. So I think Actions for, for, for Swifts referenced the Oxford City Council um, um, guidance which is one every 250 square meters of footprint which is simpler and just a bit more straightforward it means right. if you've got 250 square meters you put in one box if you've got 500 you put in two and 750 you put in three but here right. it kind yep. of looks like for the first thousand square meters you don't need to do anything you jump up yeah, yeah. okay no i take that point um yes um it I, i'd say it's pedantic detail but it, it, it's Nevertheless, detail that's important if it's going to confuse people. I, I take that point, yeah. Um, and just one further point is in section 5528 on page 51. Um, the words until, until legislation and have been removed. And I think what's left doesn't make sense um, because it says, however, further guidance from government is available small sites should aim to meet the details of B5. So I think... You just need an until. Until further government guidance. It might be, it might be too many words have been taken out. Yes, I couldn't, I couldn't establish what it was supposed so to be. So am I just missing until, however, yeah. until further government guidance? Okay. That's, that's an easy fix. <laughs> <laughs> that's unambiguous. Um, yes, absolutely, until. Okay. Good eye. Wow. Otherwise, thank you very much indeed. It was a great <laughs> I thought you were going to go to another it was, one. It was a great I topic. thought there'd be a list of things <laughs> on page Thank 50. you very much. Um, good. And um, from me, I've just got, it's, it's sort of mainly, I think, comments, but also reinforcement of perhaps what's, what's in here, John and Jane and the whole team, which is, you know, that we, we need this now. We can't wait yep. until the local plan when we've got, you know, we can put in new policy. And I, I think it goes beyond, it explains existing policy and updates it with what's come through from National um, you know, the Environment Act, the 25-year environment plan. But it also signposts what's aspirational. And I'm very, very pleased to see that we've sort of fought back and said, you know, responded to some of the concerns that we mention the aspirational target of 20%. And, you know, we insisted that that be in there. It's not an obligation, but it is what we would expect. Um, and I've, you know, talked now to um, and, and heard from major infrastructure developers like Network Rail, also from large household. They're all starting to look at 20%, even though what, you know, what is likely to come out may be still 10%, which would be a shame. But, you know, I think we have to absolutely keep that. And, and as you said, the minute this is adopted, this becomes a material consideration. Everything that is in here, which is that clarity um, as well, for us right from now in through 2022 and not waiting for the new local plan. So it's absolutely critical. I want to commend the responsiveness and you, just what you did with the SWIFT um, um, group is, is exactly that. I think the responsiveness to the... To the um, comments which shows that we do listen when we consult it's serious and we listen you can see the amount of amendments that have gone on to this document so thank you for you showing us the track changes because often that's not there so you're know, very 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 clear i'd like to point to the risks that you mentioned on page um, 99 which is in terms of the report to us 
you know, the risk to not approving this is that we cannot shape developments going forwards, you know, in the way we would want to do without having this supplementary planning document. We just don't have, you know, clarity in terms of the teeth in our current um, planning policy, so that's absolutely critical. However, as I did in the prior um, agenda item, so, and this you can do because it's not changing the supplementary planning document, John, but I do want our climate change implications in our reports and strategies to be more kind of than, you know, we, we all know we're doing good, but for example, in this one, for which is um, number 15 of the report, it's, you know, the report to committee, talking about climate change implications, saying obviously it's just good because we're going to have guidelines around biodiversity. I think the key thing is, you know, we've declared both an ecological and a climate emergency. The UN agencies have finally agreed that the climate and ecological emergencies are inextricably linked and that, you know, to, eat, to have resilience and adaptation to the climate shocks we can't avoid, we need that through natural solutions and also to store, you know, the carbon, we need natural nature-based solutions. So, you know, again, it's, it's, that's how it's affecting, you know, it's critical to our, to our delivery of that in terms of climate change, I think, um, and our doubling nature strategy. I'm very, very happy to see that the local nature partnership is sort of decided, you know, there's clarity there that this is um, the body that in terms of statutory requirements, we need a body responsible for coming up with the nature recovery network which then goes back to, okay, where do we start to look at in terms of opportunities if it has to be off-site, you know, um, offsetting, then where are those opportunities? They need to be supported by the local nature recovery network. Come back to Council Graham Cones, that's when local communities can also help to include their local areas in the local nature recovery network. Why is that critical? Because at the moment, in terms of planning, we're only looking at existing designated sites, which therefore leave out a lot of these local spaces. So the local nature recovery network will enable us to, to include those as well, which I think is good. Um, I think the baseline target, again, of reminding everyone that from, is this right? It's the 30th of January 2020. So yes. I know that there are concerns that if this comes through, then a lot of um, people wishing to develop or, or developers will just go out and cut everything down so they're not liable to having the assessment and the credit system with the DEFRA metric. So letting everybody know the baseline exists from now. So if in our local areas we have areas that we are concerned about, let's make sure that any of the ecological monitoring by local people or professionals is in the recording center, the CP, you know, um, Cambridge and Peterborough recording center, because that baseline exists. If anybody cuts it down now, they are liable now. You know, and that's critical that this biodiversity supplementary planning document also makes that absolutely clear because it's a disincentive because everybody's already liable. But I don't think many people know that, um, and both house owners, landowners, or developers. And I think the other thing is, obviously, there's a huge concern about biodiversity. And again, as you said, it's controversial um, and that this is sort of off-site and so... What is clear in this is the mitigation hierarchy. That says, you know, we go first for protecting and enhancing before then looking for somewhere off-site. And I think, again, the supplementary planning document puts the burden of responsibility on that in terms of design and, and developers. And we've got to keep that front and forth because there is, it's too easy to say, well, therefore, we're just trashing it because you might have a few credits somewhere else. But actually, the mitigation hierarchy is, is key to this as well. But I do think when it is necessary, having off-site as a possibility, at the moment the reality is we've got no teeth about biodiversity in planning. We've got so little that we can really use to make any difference. This is going to make a difference and our new local plan will make a huge difference about what we can do in terms of teeth. Um, so I would like to ask the committee if we recommend this as amended to Cabinet. Thank you. Um, Thanks very much, John, and your team for, for all, as you say, that integrated work across. Thank you very much for um, recommending it to Cabinet, and uh, I look forward to uh, them adopting it in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. And maybe, John, I don't know, is it going to be, if it's a couple of weeks' time, maybe in the Climate and Environment Week, um, it would be uh -huh. quite nice to announce it. Wouldn't it? I, I have been talking to our comms team about um, and I, I believe that the leader wanted um, last year when we were discussing this. I believe the leader wanted a big splash 
and in fact yesterday the city were asking well can we can we do some comms and i think we want to do a joined up comms uh, piece and uh, quite what that looks like is um, well it's not up to me um, <laughs> Um, but but yeah, I think it, yeah, there'll, there'll be stuff. I mean for the actual launch of it, I just mean in terms of climate environment, really, let's make the most of the fact that you know there will be a few events, and hopefully there could be some information provided about this during those events. Of course, of course. Thanks very much. Okay. Great, thank you. thank you, thank you very much, John, for that. Um, members, we are now at the last agenda item, which is the date of the next meeting, which is proposed for Monday, seventh of March at two p.m. If that's okay with everybody. Yeah, okay. And as you can see in our papers, those are some of the issues that are there for forward planning. If anybody had anything else they'd like to raise as issues they'd like to bring up for the agenda. Councillor Peter Payne. Chair, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent it's a matter for the committee, but I, I know that um, two of the parishes in my ward have recently declared a climate emergency, including some encouragement for me just to make sure that we consider climate in everything that we do. But to be frank, we're not very sure how we should take that forward. Uh, and I think maybe the district council might be able to help uh, parish councils who are interested in doing that in making it in something real. Uh, and perhaps that's something we could usefully discuss at some stage. I think that's an absolutely excellent. It's been, you know, are there, could we, I know we've talked with Siobhan about it at times, but you know, some kind of parish council toolkit for now you've declared a climate emergency what can you do? You know, what are the simple things? There's lots and lots of kind of different manuals and things out there, and it's just sort of bringing this together. Oh, lovely. There you are, Siobhan. Yes. We don't have to have the discussion now, but, you know, agreeing to put that onto, onto the agenda. Yes, absolutely. I think at this stage, that, that's all that to say, but we will definitely put that on the agenda, if not for March, then for the one after. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Good. And at almost 4.30, um, I'll bring this meeting to a close. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks again, Siobhan, for all the work of putting this together, um, as always. And thank you, everybody, members. And I hope at some point we can all be in the chamber together. <laughs> That'd be lovely. <laughs> thank you, Grenville. Lovely to see you. It's nice to see you too, and very sad to be doing it this way. The sooner we can get, to get into the meeting together, the better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Although I would say, as long as we've got kind of COVID going, I do think we should make sure we're as safe as possible. But anyway, thank you. I'm glad to see you. Happy and well. Happy New Year, everybody.